Hello and welcome. Welcome, 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 welcome. welcome to Trish Thinking Podcast. Podcast. It's another edition of the Just Thinking Podcast. I am Virgil Walker. And I am Daryl Harrison. What's going on, Omaha? <laughs> what up, Doc? How you doing, man? I'm doing fantastic, man. How you doing? I'm doing well, man. It's good to be back, man. Your your intro made me want to take a take a little bit of water, man. I'm gonna have to get hydrated. <laughs> yeah, I had I had to make up for that intro that I sort of flubbed on the last episode. Oh man, you know, with uh, episode one twelve, uh, we it had been a couple months, man, since we've been on the air with one another. So yeah, I there's an Omaha and got kind of choked up. Got, there, so got I got I, I need to make up for that one. <laughs> got kind of got kind of caught up, man. Our our friend, man, John Cooper, man. He was like, "Hey, bro, the Omaheezy might need some help, man. You might need to." <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, like, I'm like the Tin Man, the Wizard of Oz, man. I might need a little oil on the vocal cords. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but man, you 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 made up for it, man. You had you had the jingle that the haters jingle, you know. Let your haters yeah, be yeah. your motivators, and yeah, yeah. So yeah. we, you and, know, and we, and we and we have that for our listeners, man. We do have a remix version of that jingle now. Yeah, man, we got the we're, remix. We're, 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 we're working on trying to make it available to everybody. So hold tight. If you wanted, to, we had so many people, man, come up and say, "Hey, I like to have that jingle as my ringtone." <laughs> well, we're trying to make that happen. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right man well it's good to be back it's good to be back behind the microphone i know we got a lot of content to run through man and, and i know a lot of times our folks you know they jump in to the podcast they 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 listen to the particulars i i've had some people say they fast forward with with kind of our our intro stuff man but true yeah. f- true fans of the show man they know how we get down they know we warm up yeah. a little bit and yeah. and uh, before we jump into some things one of the things that i want to mention man we mentioned last time uh, was was a, a the pregame proverb with John Rayner? It's it's a daily devotional. Each morning goes through the through the writings of uh, or through Solomon's writings rather, and he's working on a verse by verse exposition of Ecclesiastes. If you're interested in the devotional, you could sign up for that. Go on Apple Podcasts wherever you stream your podcast. It's the pregame proverb, and uh, it, a lot of folks from the last time man were really. Uh, grateful and and uh, felt like it was a great benefit to them. So we're we're happy to to have uh, the pregame proverb John sign up with us again and want us to give a mention of that. We're hopeful that that's beneficial for him and those who get over to to check him out. I know we've got we got some big announcements of our own regarding uh regarding just thinking man. We, we, you want you want to give our folks the particulars of that? No man, you the MC bro. Go ahead and make <laughs> let the people let the people know. <laughs> <laughs> well, we we are extremely, extremely excited about the fact that our first book, Just Thinking About the State, uh, is about to take flight, man. We've been working on this. What it feels like almost a year, man. Maybe it was it. Maybe it's it was, been about a year. It's yeah. been about a year, bro. Yeah, maybe, maybe about, about a year ago when we just started kind of thinking through this and and talking with publishers, and we got on a number of different Zoom calls and began trying to work out 
you know, how do we do this? What does it look like for us and uh, and for our fans? And and how does it make sense based upon the time commitments that you and I both have? But but man, we're excited about the fact that that uh, just thinking about the state, it will be coming August thirty first. 2020, but you can pre-order. You can, and and I'm I'm going to encourage people to to get on the website uh, and pre-order uh, on on the founders website. Get on and pre pre-order uh, your your copy, your very own copy of Just Thinking About the State. Anything else you want to add to that, man? Yeah. So the website is founders.org. Just go to founders.org, and you'll see it right there on the home page. Just Thinking About the State, and I want to encourage you not to just get a copy for yourself. Or your family, but encourage your pastors, encourage your elders at your churches to purchase copies of these books um, in mass for your for mm-hmm. their congregants. Mm-hmm. Uh, because what's really cool about this book is that there are Bible study questions that Virgil himself wrote mm. um, after every chapter. Okay, so each chapter concludes with a set of Bible study questions that challenge you to go deeper into Scripture to understand the subject matter that's being addressed in that particular chapter. So mm-hmm. go to founders.org. You can pre-order just thinking about the state. I think it's what, $13? Yep. Yep. Which pre-order. is about $5 less than retail if yep. you pre-order. Uh, so again, the book begins to ship August 31st. Mm-hmm. Just go to founders.org for your own copy or copies yes. of just <laughs> thinking about the state. Yeah. Uh, one more plug verse before we move ahead here, bro. I want to, you know, Jenna Ellis, constitutional attorney, is a great friend of ours, good friend of the show. Mm-hmm. And Jenna Ellis is launching her brand new podcast on the Salem Network, Salem Communications Network, beginning September 13th. It's called the simply the Jenna Ellis Show. And we want to encourage our listeners to go out and uh, subscribe to that podcast. We don't recommend uh, other podcasts uh, too often uh, yeah. on just thinking. So uh, we do take uh, situations like this where we can refer others to solid uh, biblically sound content. That's mm-hmm. what we want to do. That's mm-hmm. what we do here on JT. Mm-hmm. And we we only refer uh, you to other podcasts or other platforms that mirror that commitment. So again, it's ta- called the Jenna Ellis show. It begins September 13th. So we encourage you to check that out. Absolutely. Anything else, V? Now, just, just uh, man, I want to say one, one last thing about the book, and that is how uh, incredibly honored we were to, ha- to have uh, John, Dr. John MacArthur uh, write a foreword for our book. And, uh, man, he just had some great things to say and as, as he was impressed. I got a chance to, uh, uh, about a week ago, Daryl, to talk with him on, on the phone as we were working on issues for G3. And he wanted to make sure I was keeping you in line and, and uh, making sure that you were yep. doing <laughs> Yeah, there there are a lot of people assigned to make sure I stay in line. A lot of people assigned to me in that regard. Absolutely. But man, I, I got a chance just to thank him for the forward for the book. And he was very appreciative of the work that that you do, obviously, for him at, at GTY and what we do with just thinking and uh, and what he believes is is going to be a, a beneficial to to the body of Christ with regard to the book. So we just want to commend the book to you and encourage you to go get it. We're talking all about issues around, about the state as we're watching the encroachment of government on every facet of life, uh, from vaccines to to CRT to uh, you name it. I mean, but we we cover a number of different issues in the book, from government to socialism to capitalism and the like. You'll want this copy on your in in your library i promise you that so that's the last thing i'll say about the book as we get ready to unpack uh, for this particular episode of the just thinking podcast yeah you know omaha the episode of the just thinking podcast that we're recording today is somewhat unique in that the topic we're dealing with is one that was suggested to us by numerous listeners Mm -hmm. we don't normally make a practice of taking suggestions for for topic ideas Though we do appreciate that our listeners think highly enough of the Just Thinking Podcast to trust us to deal faithfully with the topics they do suggest to us. Mm-hmm, okay, so mm-hmm. we're very thankful and we're incredibly humbled by that. Now, that said, we're here today on the, this episode of the Just Thinking Podcast to talk about what the Word of God has to say about sinful fear and anxiety. Mm. Now, I say <clears throat> sinful fear and anxiety because I believe there's an important distinction to be made between illegitimate fear and anxiety and fear and anxiety that is in fact legitimate now we'll endeavor to examine those distinctions later in this episode but suffice it to say not all fear and anxiety is sinful in and of itself okay not all fear and anxiety is sinful in and of itself you know one of the manifestations of god's common grace in the world 
is that embedded within each of us as image bearers of God is an element of fear and anxiety that is healthy. Mm -hmm. Healthy, that is, in the sense that when one considers that we live in a world that has been corrupted by sin, we know that from Romans 8, 19 through 21, there are occasions and instances when expressions of fear or anxiety are entirely right and proper. Okay? For example, let's say you wake up tomorrow morning and find that there is a brown recluse spider on your pillow looking you right in the face. <laughs> now, in such a situation, I would suggest that you have every right to be fearful because of your awareness that brown recluse spiders are among some of the most venomous spiders in the world. Mm -hmm. And to be bitten by one is very likely to result in serious bodily harm to you. But that's just one example. There are others, of course. But the point I'm trying to make here is perhaps better reflected in these words from Dr. Stuart Scott, who in his book titled Anger, Anxiety and Fear, A Biblical Perspective, says this, quote, There is a fear or danger and difficult circumstances that is reasonable. We would not be living in reality if we did not even consider how an upcoming situation might affect us. Mm. God wants us to live in reality, but at the same time, he wants us to bring him into the picture. It is reasonable to respond to danger and disaster. God has equipped us with a bodily response, an increase in adrenaline production that can help us when physical danger is imminent. This increase can cause other bodily responses, pounding heart, muscle tension, heightened awareness, dry mouth, perspiration, and butterflies of the stomach. As long as we do not let our fear or our feelings keep us from doing what is right, and we turn to God in our fear, that fear is not ungodly. Mm -hmm. Okay? We are all going to feel afraid sometimes. But don't make the mistake of equating courage with a lack of feeling afraid. That's good. The most courageous Christians are those who feel afraid, but who, when they feel afraid, place their trust in God and do what he says to do. The question is, what do we do when we are afraid? And then Dr. Scott closes that quote with Psalm 56.3, when I am afraid, I will put my trust in you. Mm. That quote was from Dr. Stuart Scott from his book, mm. Anger, Anxiety, and Fear, A Biblical Perspective. Now, it is against the backdrop of those words from Dr. Stuart Scott that I think it would be helpful at this point in our episode, Omaha, to set some expectations for our listeners, particularly with regard to what this episode is not. Okay? I want to clarify what this episode is not. This episode of the Just Thinking Podcast on sinful fear and anxiety should not be construed or regarded as an exhaustive or comprehensive treatment of that subject. Nor is this episode intended to address any and every conceivable individual situation or circumstance imaginable in which a believer might experience sinful fear and anxiety, or conversely, how he or she should respond in every situation and circumstance because such instances are unique to each individual. Our goal in this episode of the Just Thinking Podcast is simply to provide our listeners with some biblical principles and precepts from God's word concerning the topic of sinful fear and anxiety, as God grants us the humility and wisdom to do so. We want to encourage believers to take those principles and precepts that we're going to discuss, take them to heart, and apply them in their own lives so far as the Spirit of God directs them, okay? And I think our heart's desire for people who are listening to this episode of the Just Thinking Podcast is reflected quite well, Omaha, in these words from the 17th century English Puritan John Owen, who in his book titled Searching Our Hearts in Difficult Times, said this, quote, Oh, that we might advise one another as to what to do to help one another to recover from our weaknesses. This is what we are called to, what is required of us, to have faith in the faithfulness of Christ who has built his church upon the rock so that however bad things might be, nothing will prevail against it. To have faith in the fullness of the spirit and Christ's promise to send him to renew the face of the church, to have faith in apprehending the truth of God who has foretold these things 
and to have a faith that stirs us up to attend to those special duties that God requires at our hands at such a time, unquote. And that is our desire and prayer for this episode of the Just Thinking Podcast, that God would grant us his wisdom so that we might be able to advise our brothers and sisters who may be struggling with sinful fear and anxiety to, as John Owen said, recover from their weaknesses. And we all have weaknesses. All of us, every one of us has weaknesses. As Dr. David Pallison, whom I will quote on more than one occasion over the course of this episode, writes in his excellent book titled How Sanctification Works, Dr. Pallison says this, quote, The darkness of the human condition is characterized by two immense wrongs that create turmoil throughout our lives. A complete mix of moral evils arises from inside us. A complex mix of situational evils besets us. The Bible uses the word evil to describe both sin and suffering, just as we do in English. Sometimes something inside us is wrong. Something inside us is wrong. People believe, think, feel, want, and do bad things. Uh Of course, the obvious atrocities are moral evils, but the falsity, self-deception, and godlessness of, quote, normal, unquote, life and the misshapenness of, quote, normal, unquote, Mm -hmm. desires similarly count as moral evil in God's assessment. We are, quote, off, unquote, in relation to both God and other people, and things outside us are wrong. Bad things happen to us. Other people betray us. We face losses, sicknesses, and death. We swim in the falsehoods of our sociocultural milieu. A liar and murderer, meaning Satan, is out to deceive and kill us. In some, we face troubles externally. We are troublesome interpersonally, and we are troubled psychologically, struggling both with what we face and with who we are, unquote. That was Dr. David Pallison from his book, How Sanctification Works. And Dr. Pallison says we struggle both with what we face and with who we are. That's very true. But even so, thanks be to God that his elect can rely on these comforting and reassuring words from the psalmist in Psalm 103, 14. Psalm 103, verse 14, the psalmist writes this, For he himself, that is God, for God knows our frame. He is mindful that we are but dust. So again, I just want to say that at the outset of this episode, so as to try to establish some context as well as some expectations, uh, Omaha, for what this episode is intended to be and what it is not intended to accomplish. Any mm-hmm. thoughts, man? No, I, I, I appreciate the way that, that, that you opened this segment. And I, I want to charge our listeners at this point, as, as, as most folks who follow us on Just Thinking know, uh, when we cover a particular topic, man, we do so incredibly, first of all, biblically. That's our primary responsibility. How, how, what does the Bible have to say about the, the issue at hand? And then secondarily, we bring a lot of resources to bear, and this episode is no different. As I examine the landscape of culture, I can't think of a time when there was more fear actually happening in the personal lives of individuals. And, and this is one of those times when this particular episode, I think, is just incredibly timely. And, uh, and so my, my challenge to listeners would be, one, to get a pen, some paper. Uh, in, the, in your opening monologue alone, Daryl, you've already cited three different authors, quoted three different verses of scripture, and, and we're just opening up to set the boundaries and guidelines. And so mm-hmm. as, this, as this particular episode unfolds, I, I think you sent me 26 different authors that you're going to yep. quote during the course of this. Mm-hmm. I, mm-hmm. I've, I've added another 10 authors to that based upon my my commentary as as this episode unfolds. So, so within this, you're going to have 36 different authors whose books I would commend to you uh, as, as reading. So if, if you're in a state of fear and you're dealing with this issue on a, on, a, on a daily basis, as many of us are, there may be through the course of this episode a particular author or a book that that we're going to encourage you to go out and grab and 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 you know put that in your library as a part of of, of what helps you navigate uh, the, the the issues of the day. Let me get back to my notes. I think we can both acknowledge that 
the subject of fear and anxiety is so broad that there's no possible way to address every single area of life which someone can in which someone can experience fear. It's great that we make distinctions, and, and Daryl, that you made the distinctions that you did. As always, we want to approach the subject biblically. As we do, it's essential to identify the differences between godly fear, as found in Proverbs 9 and 10, which says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge, uh, and knowledge of the Holy One is insight, and fear that one experiences as the result of the fear of man, Matthew 10, 28, which says, do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. That's, that's um, Matthew 10, 28. One of the things that I want to add to, to what I'm sharing here is Daryl started by unpacking the, the, the fear you should have, and, and he used the example of, uh, of a spider. Yeah, th- there's, there's fear that's there because you understand the fallen world in which we live and the nature of of death and and the seriousness with which which that situation would put would would put you in, but what's happening in culture is is far different from that kind of fear. Today, however, culture, mainly the media, seems to peddle in the fear of man. Right? You just take a mm-hmm. quick look at the front pages of any major media outlet, and you'll find what you'll find is an endless parade of fear. As a, as a part of headline news, let me give you a couple of examples. I was perusing CNN.com at the time of this recording, and, uh, and they had the following stories. Earthquake strikes near Haiti. Dozens have died after the magnitude 7.2 earthquake. And one hospital, here's the fear, and one hospital is overwhelmed without supplies. So, so again, what, not just that the, that the horrifying tragedy that took place in Haiti with the earthquake— but the fear at adding on to that of hospitals being without supplies. Um, add to that, another one said, uh, quote, Antarctica is melting. Its future could be catastrophic. And again, here's the, here's the peddling in anxiety and fear. Finally, there's a story taking direct aim at fear as it reads, still people have fear what life is like in some cities after the Taliban. And so this is the issue overseas where, where the Taliban is wreaking havoc back again on Afghanistan. And, 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 and the headlines are, are really focused on the fear that's surrounded uh, uh, you know, by that, that simple example. Here in the United States, we have everything from CRT to COVID to socialist communism that are on the rise. And all of this creates a tremendous amount of anxiety and fear. It's, it's time for us, again, to address this topic with biblical clarity as we get things started. So as we broach this topic, man, I'm reminded of a conversation, Daryl, that I had earlier this week with Dr. Josh Bice. Uh, he was reading to me in his office a quote from Calvin, and I thought it was really apropos in the context uh, that, that we'll find ourselves in and, and as, as, it, as it relates to the topic of fear. As, as we do on the Just Thinking podcast, we always want to immerse ourselves first in the subject matter before we, mm-hmm. we bring, it, bring the subject to our listeners. Well, it was John Calvin who said this. This was the quote that Dr. Josh Bice shared with me today, uh, last week. It's a quote from Calvin. It says, quote, if a preacher is not first preaching to himself, better that he falls on the steps of the pulpit and breaks his neck than preach that sermon, end quote. And so as we, as we think about mm. Calvin's words in that instance and how important it is for those who are, who are sharing the truth, who are sharing the word in this instance, as, as it pertains to Calvin's quote, they, that they immerse themselves in what's, you know, the, mm. the content, the subject matter that, that they're sharing. I, I think it's important for you and I, as we begin this process, to, to, to examine our own hearts and lives and make sure that we have a proper biblical fear of God, uh, not the fear of man. Uh, and that we understand the nature of the fallen world in which we live. So I, I'll, I'll open that up as my kind of opening monologue to get things started, Daryl. What you got for us, brother? Yeah, that was first of all, I need to say that was a fire quote from Calvin, bro. Yeah, yeah. That quote was fire, but yeah. what do you expect from Calvin? Right, right. <laughs> <clears throat> you know, I mentioned earlier, Omaha, that there's a distinction to be made between sinful fear and anxiety and fear and anxiety that is healthy and normal within the context of God's common grace, which he bestows upon each of his image bearers. Now, the approach I like to take in contrasting the two is to leverage an illustration from the banking and finance in- industry in which I spent many years regarding how to distinguish between counterfeit currency and the real thing. Mm. 
the way that people in the FBI and the Department of the Treasury and the Secret Service become so proficient at recognizing counterfeit currency is that they spend countless hours studying the real thing. Now, my point here is that when you learn to recognize what legitimate fear and anxiety actually are, you're then able to distinguish between that and illegitimate or sinful fear and anxiety and subsequently to respond accordingly, which is to say to respond biblically. Okay, it is an unfortunate reality, Omaha, that most people, including many professing Christians, define fear and anxiety through the subjective lens of their own situational Mm -hmm. and circumstantial experience, Mm -hmm. as opposed to through the objective and fixed lens of the word of God. Now, I say that in light of these words from the Puritan John Flavel, who in his book titled Triumphing Over Sinful Fear, said this, quote, There is as much diversity in people's inward moods and dispositions as in their outward features. Mm -hmm. Some are as frightened as rabbits and jump at every sound, even a dog's bark. Some are as bold as lions and face danger without trembling. Some fear more than they ought and others when they ought not at all. The carnal person fears man, not God. The strong Christian fears God not man. The weak Christian fears man too much and God too little. There is a fear which is the effect of sin. It springs from guilt and hurries the soul into more guilt. There is a fear which is the effect of grace. It springs from our love to God and his interest and drives the soul to him in the way of duty. The less fear a person has, the more happiness he has, unless, of course, It is that fear which is his happiness and his excellence. Let me repeat that sentence. The less fear a person has, the more happiness he has. Unless, of course, it is that fear which is his happiness and his excellence. Mm. It cannot be said of any person as it is said of Leviathan. He is, quote, made without fear, unquote. That's Job 41.33b. The strongest people are not without some fears. When the church is in the storms of persecution and almost covered with waves, her most courageous passengers may suffer as much from the boisterous passion within as from the storm without. This is the result of not thoroughly believing or seasonably remembering that the Lord, Admiral admiral of all the oceans and commander of all the winds, is on board the ship to steer it and preserve it from the storm, unquote. That was John Flavel from his book, Triumphing Over Sinful Fear. I want to repeat that last sentence from Flavel. Flavel said that our fears and anxieties are the result of not thoroughly believing or seasonably remembering that the Lord, admiral of all the oceans and commander of all the winds, is on board the ship to steer it and preserve it from the storm. Now, I'm intrigued by Flavel's use of that phrase, seasonably remembering, Omaha. And I don't want our listeners to miss that because I think it's a very important phrase. The reason I'm intrigued by Flavel's choice of words there is because I'm convinced that it's in those, quote, seasons, unquote, of trial and adversity that many professing Christians tend to succumb to sinful fear and anxiety in their life. This ongoing COVID reality that we're all currently dealing with is is in one way or another a a very tangible and palpable example of one of those seasons, if you will. And it's in these types of seasons, as Flavel said, that many professing Christians tend to forget that the Lord is, as John Flavel said, aboard the ship to steer it Mm. and preserve it from the storm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In, In fact, I wouldn't be at all surprised if John Flavel may have had in mind Matthew chapter 8, verses 23 and 20 through 27. I wouldn't be surprised if he had that passage in mind when he penned those words that I quoted just a couple moments ago. I'm going to read Matthew 8, verses 23 and 27. When he, that is Jesus, got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being covered with waves. But Jesus himself was asleep. And they came to him and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. He said to them, Why are you afraid, you men of little faith? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the sea, and it became perfectly calm. 
the men were amazed and said, what kind of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? That was Matthew 8, verses 23 through 27. Now, our listeners may be interested to know, Omaha, that it is from verse 26 of that passage in Matthew 8 that we took the title for this episode of the Just Mm -hmm. Thinking Podcast, Why Are You Afraid? Because for the Christian anyway, this matter of sinful fear and anxiety is fundamentally a matter of what we allow into our minds, and more specifically, what we choose to allow our minds to dwell on as a replacement or substitute for dwelling on the truth of God's word. Now, I say that in light of such passages as Philippians 4, 6a, be anxious for nothing. Mm-hmm. 2 Timothy 1, 7, for God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. Matthew chapter 10, verse 28a, do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul. Then there's Matthew six thirty four. so do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself each day has enough trouble of its own. Now, those verses are just some of the scriptures that are easy enough for us to remember and recall when things are going well for us in life. Mm. But, 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 but when some unexpected or unanticipated difficulty or trial providentially interrupts our lives, those verses and the truths they contain suddenly aren't so easy for us to recall. That's good. Because it's because it's in those unanticipated situations and circumstances that we actually have to put those truths to work by faith. Yep. As I said before, Omaha, it's easy to be like Jesus until you have to be like Jesus. That's <laughs> good, man. But what we as followers of Jesus Christ have to remember in those instances is that, as I said earlier, those situations are all providentially ordained and orchestrated by God himself. I say that in the context of one of my favorite verses in the entire Bible, Omaha, you know what it is, particularly with regard to the situations and circumstances that may produce fear and anxiety within us. And that verse is Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 14. Mm -hmm. Ecclesiastes 7, verse 14, which in the non-Arminian Bible reads like this, in the day of prosperity, be happy. But in the day of adversity, remember, God has made the one as well as the other. Mm. That's Ecclesiastes 7.14, in the day of prosperity, be happy. But in the day of adversity, remember, God has made the one day as well as the other. Now, I've often said that if you can get the words of Ecclesiastes 7.14, words that reinforce the absolute sovereignty of God over everything that happens to us, if you can get those words firmly and deeply embedded into your heart and mind, you'll never have a bad, a bad day. Never. You will never have a bad day. If you can grasp the context and the import of Ecclesiastes 17, you will never have another bad day. And yet, in light of the exhortation that we have in Ecclesiastes 7.14 to, quote, remember that God has made the one as well as the other, unquote, the question for us becomes, when we are overcome with sensations of fear and anxiety, what are we choosing to remember in those moments? Mm. What are you choosing to remember in those remember in those moments when those sensations of sinful fear and anxiety overcome you? What are you choosing to set the focus of your mind on? Now, I pose those questions because the truth is that whatever you choose to set your mind on in those moments when you when you're feeling fearful and anxious, and it is a choice. It's a choice that you make. Whatever you choose to set your mind on in those moments, Whatever you choose to set your mind on is precisely the thing that is going to guide and direct you in those moments. Did you hear me? Whatever you choose to fix your mind on, that's what's going to guide you in those moments. Now, I want our listeners to ruminate on that as I read the following quote from Dr. Edward T. Welch. Dr. Edward Welch, in his book titled Running Scared, subtitled Fear, Worry, and the God of Rest. Mm. Dr. Edward Welch, from his book Running Scared, Fear, worry, and the God of rest. Dr. Welch said this, quote, Anytime you love or want something deeply, you will notice fear and anxieties because you might not get them. Mm -hmm. Anytime you can't control the fate of those things you want or love, you will notice fears and anxiety because you might lose them. Good insurance policies might help, but they only lessen the risk on things that aren't our real worries. They can't ensure that our loved ones will outlive us or keep us from the ravages of old age. Control and certainty are myths. Unquote. 
Did you hear me, listener? Did you hear that last sentence from Dr. Ed Welch from his book, Running Scared? Dr. Welch said, control and certainty are myths. You know, Omaha, it was, it was many years ago, back in my Arminian days, before I was exposed to Reformed theology and the doctrines of grace, that a former pastor of mine, whose name many of our listeners would, would recognize, they would likely, likely know if I were to mention it, mm-hmm. said something that has stuck with me to this very day. That former pastor friend of mine said, the battlefield of Satan is the mind. Mm. The battlefield of Satan is the mind. The 17th century English Puritan William Grinnell wrote this, quote, The fiery darts of Satan, which the believing soul is able by faith to quench, may be described as of two sorts. First, either those that do pleasingly entice and bewitch with some seeming promise of satisfaction to the creature, or second, such as affright and carry horror with them, unquote. So that's William Gunnar. William Gunnar says there's two, two types of flaming arrows for, from Satan that we can, we can expect. The first would be arrows that please and entice and bewitch us with some seeming promise of satisfaction. But the second arrow is the arrow that causes fear and anxiety, or what Gunnar uh, described as a fright and horror. The Puritan theologian Richard Sibbs has some wise counsel for us concerning guarding our minds against Satan's tactics in his classic book titled The Bruised Reed, where he writes this. This is Rich, Richard Sibbs from his book titled the, the Bruised Reed. Quote, are you bruised? Be of good comfort. He calls you. Conceal not your wounds. Open all before him and take not Satan's counsel. Mm-hmm. Go to Christ, although trembling, as the poor woman who said, if I may but touch his garment, Matthew nine twenty one. We shall be healed and have a gracious answer. Go boldly to God in our flesh. He is flesh of our flesh and bone of our bone for this reason that we might go boldly to him. Never fear to go to God since we have such a mediator with him who is not only our friend but our brother and husband. Let the world be as it will. If we cannot rejoice in the world, yet we may rejoice in the Lord. His presence, that is the Lord's presence, makes any condition comfortable, unquote. Mm. Wow. That was the period in Richard Sibbs from his book, The Bruised Reed. And I just want to make sure our listeners heard that last sentence. Sibbs said that the Lord's presence makes any condition comfortable. And yet, in spite of that truth, I wonder how many professing Christians listening to me right now are struggling with sinful fear, and anxiety due to the fact that they are discontent with their present condition, Mm -hmm. as Sibbs put it. Mm -hmm. I say that in light of what the Puritan writer Thomas Boston says in his book, Human Nature in Its Fourfold State. Human Nature in Its Fourfold State. The Puritan Thomas Boston says this, Is not everyone by nature discontented with his present lot in this world or with some one thing or other in it? This also with Adam's case, Genesis chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Some one thing is always missing so that man is a creature given to changes. And if any doubt this, let them look over all their enjoyments and after a review of them, listen to their own hearts and they will hear a secret murmuring for want of something else. Mm. Though perhaps, though perhaps if they considered the matter aright, they would see that it is better for them to want than to have that something, Mm -hmm. unquote. Wow. That was Thomas Boston from his book, Human Nature in Its Fourfold State. Now, before I hand it over to you, Armaha, for your thoughts, I want to go off script for just a moment and say that those words from Thomas Boston take me to Daniel chapter 3, verses 15 through 18, where we have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who are about to be thrown into the fiery furnace by King Nebuchadnezzar for refusing to worship the golden image Mm -hmm. that Nebuchadnezzar had had set up. I want to read Daniel 3, verses 15 through 18. Now, if you are ready, at the moment, this is King Nebuchadnezzar speaking to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, if you are ready, at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, and bagpipe, and all kinds of music, to fall down and worship the image I have made very well. But if you do not worship, 
you will immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. And what God is there who can deliver you out of my hands? Mm -hmm. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver to deliver us from the fiery furnace of blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Now that was Daniel 3, verses 15 through 18. Mm -hmm. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said to King Nebuchadnezzar, our God will deliver us from this flaming furnace, but even if he does not, we, will, we still are not going to worship you or your golden image. You see, Omaha, that's the kind of sanctification and spiritual maturity that every professing believer in Christ should aspire to, to attain. Mm. To be so secure, to be so secure in our belief and trust in God and in his character that we can say, just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, even if he does not answer my prayer or resolve this situation or circumstance in the manner that I would like, I'm still going to refrain I'm still going to remain faithful to him and trust him nonetheless so that my heart and mind are at peace with any and all circumstances because I have the peace of God, which scripture says in Philippians 4, 7, surpasses all human mm -hmm. comprehension and understanding. Yeah. So that's what we want to be. We want to get, we want God to bring us to a place in our sanctification and maturity that we can say just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Yes, Lord, I want you to deliver me. I want you to resolve this situation. But even if you don't, mm. that's what we want to get to. Yeah. Thoughts, bro? Absolutely. Man, I, when, when you, the quote that you raised by the Puritan theologian Richard Sibbs when he said, his presence makes any condition comfortable, I automatically went back to the text of scripture that you quoted earlier from Ecclesiastes 7.14. Uh, because it, it, the way this works, if if you're if you're thinking about what it says in Ecclesiastes seven fourteen, uh, it says this: in the day of prosperity, be happy, but in the day of adversity, remember God has made one as well as the other. And I know that's your favorite mm -hmm. verse. I, I mean, mm -hmm. if, if if anybody has followed the Just Thinking podcast for any lengthy period of time, they know that that's that, that's your favorite verse, and. Uh, the the reason, and I love what you said when you talked about how if you if if you can really settle that in your heart, you'll have a good day. The reason that's possible is because of the fact that you understand that God's presence makes any condition comfortable. Amen, Th that that's why you can have a, a a day that that if focused rightly on the Lord, not that the situation may not be tragic or sad, but if your focus is on the fact that His presence makes any condition comfortable, that, God, that the presence of God makes every condition comfortable, that more than, more than life itself, your desire is to maintain your relationship with the Lord. Uh, you, can, you can demonstrate all of what you said. When you talked about Shadrach, Meshach, and, and Abednego, I, I always say a, a bad Negro. I know you always get on me about that. <laughs> Shadrach, Meshach, and one bad Bro. Negro. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Our listeners had to know that was coming if they if they if they follow us at all. I I can't I can't hear anything else when you say that, <laughs> bro. No. <laughs> but let me get back to let me get back to what I thought. Please, we, you've you've been quoting. You hilarious. We you you've been you've been quoting from these Puritans, and I started thinking about the life and times of the Puritans, and and about what was known at that time as Puritanism. Uh, now the Puritans, they desired the Church of England, you know, they, they desired for the Church of England rather to to stand more strongly and firmly upon Scripture than they did about mimicking the ecclesiology of the Church of England. Uh, mm -hmm. They 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 or, or the ecclesiology of Rome is what I, what I meant to say with regard to that. They they didn't want to be a part of Rome. They didn't want to endorse Rome and its systems and its and its popes uh, and and the like. They wanted a pure church, which is hence the name, the Puritans. If you consider their time, the late uh, the late uh, 1500s, the, the early 1600s, it was a time that was filled with religious persecution. In fact, religious persecution was at an all-time high in England during the time of the Puritans. And it was during this 17th century that nearly 20,000 Puritans emigrated to the United States. Uh, even as the Puritans endured trials both in England and at times in the newly formed 
Republic, their focus was not on their situation. As you've read their remarks during the podcast, the, the, the time that they endured, they reflected upon and focused upon two things. One was the, the, the purity of the scripture, and they focused on the providential hand of God. Now, as, as I reflect upon the high amount of anxiety that we all experience, and believe me, I'm not trying to minimize anyone's feelings of anxiety. However, the, so, the source of the stress is often due, the, due to the result of a misplaced focus on ourselves and our mm. own importance. One of the yeah. things that, that I'm struck with regarding the Puritans, mainly when I read, is it, mainly when I read Puritan prayers, is how they understood their own lowliness or you might say their own unrighteousness as compared to the sovereignty of God and his providence in the universe. Now, if you were to contrast that, if you were to contrast the, the purity and, and, and the, the lowliness of the thoughts of the Puritans with the kinds of prayers that modern day evangelicals pray uh, as they pray to Jesus, a Jesus that they see as their homie, there's a drastic difference. And I, I wanna just briefly give you an example of a Puritan prayer and how they focused on on their own unrighteousness uh, and, and as it's evidenced in Puritan prayers. This is a prayer entitled Sin. It's on page 87 of the Valley of Vision. And this mm -hmm. Puritan writer writes this. He says this, Merciful Lord, pardon all of my sins of this day, week, year, all of the sins of my life, sins of the early, middle, and advanced years of omission and commission, of morose, peevish, and angry tempers, of lip, life, and walk, of hard-heartedness, unbelief, presumption, pride, of unfaithfulness to the souls of men, of want of bold decision in the cause of Christ, of deficiency in outspoken zeal for his glory, of bringing dishonor upon thy great name, of deception, injustice, untruthfulness in my dealings with others, of impurity in thought, word, and deed, of covetousness, which is idolatry, of substance unduly hoarded, improvidentially in, in squandered, not consecrated to the glory of thee, the great giver, sins in private and in family, in study and recreation, in busy haunts of men and in the study of thy word and the neglect of it in prayer irreverently offered with with coldly and and coldly withheld mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. time misspent in yielding to satan's wiles in opening my heart to his temptations in being unwatchful when i know when when i know him nigh in quenching the holy spirit Sins against light and knowledge, sins against conscience and the restraints of thy spirit, sins against the law of eternal love. Pardon all of my sins, known and unknown, felt and unfelt, confessed and not confessed, remembered or forgotten. Good Lord, hear and hearing, forgive. That is a quote from the Puritan uh, it, as written in the Valley of Visions. And when I think about those kinds of in-depth prayers. Uh, man, I'm struck with the writer's deep focus on his sinfulness and unrighteousness before a holy mm -hmm. God. Now, this is the proper position of reflection and repentance, followed by the light of the gospel that should be relief to any sinner. And mm -hmm. you ask the question, why? Well, it's because God, the righteous judge, has forgiven you. This understanding may not be analogous to those listening. However, when we have too high a view of our own importance, we begin to worry about things that we have little or no control over. Compare that to the prayer uh, that, that, uh, that, that by a famous evangelical preacher today. This is a brief prayer. Let me read it to you and, and give you an insight into what, what parishioners are being fed as, as it pertains to today and, and, our, and, our, and the shallowness of our prayers. This, this particular evang evangelical preacher prayed this, quote, I declare, we, we got a problem right there. I, I can just stop yep. right there. We got a problem. We, right we, got there. A pro we got a problem not with I declare, but I. Right, right. I declare I will speak only positive words of faith and victory over myself. 
my family and my future. I will not use my words to describe the situation. I will use my words to change my situation. I will call in favor, good breaks, healing, and restoration. I will not talk to God about how big my problems are. That's a problem. I will talk to God about, how, about my problems about how big my God is. This is my declaration in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, that's the nature of the shallowness of prayer. And so it shouldn't be, we shouldn't be shocked by the fact that there seems to be much dread, anxiety, and worry in the life of the modern day believer. The reason why is because this is a prayer that is really aimed at praying to oneself. Mm -hmm. This is a prayer that's prayed as if the person praying it is indeed equivalent to God, able to orchestrate their day rather than realizing that they are a fallen sinner in a world in desperate need of the sovereignty of God. And again, my point in raising these two examples is to expose that we often find ourselves worrying because we truly do not depend on God. We are strictly relying on ourselves. Man, that's a hard truth right there, Omaha. And I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, in, in the prayer from that evangelical that you just quoted, did he say he was going to pray for good breaks? Yeah, good breaks. Is he, is he talking, about, uh, he's talking about luck or his car? I, I think both. I, I think, I think <laughs> if, 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 if I name the name, you would know exactly who it was. I just don't want to give credit to that evangelical. But yeah, because this, this same evangelical prayed for, for, the, for the parking space close, to the, uh, close to, the, in, in, to the mall, in the mall. He prayed for the right parking space. So it could have been either his breaks or it could have been luck. Who knows? Wow. Anyway, man, you know, I said earlier, Omaha, that the battlefield of Satan is the mind. The battlefield of Satan is the mind. I believe that to be true, particularly when it comes to this matter of sinful fear and anxiety. You know, the first account of fear and anxiety in human history is found in Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 through 10, and the account of the fall of mankind. Let me just read that passage. Genesis 3, verses 8 through 10. They, that is Adam and Eve, heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. That's Genesis 3, verses 8 through 10. Now the word afraid in verse 10 of Genesis 3 is a Hebrew verb spelled Y-A-R-E, yare, which translated means to be fearful, to be in a state of dread, or to be in awe of. Now, of course, having sinned against a holy and righteous God, Adam and Eve had every reason to be in dread in that moment. But listen to what John Calvin has to say about their reaction in his commentary on Genesis chapter 3, verse 10. This is John Calvin in his Genesis commentary on uh, his commentary on Genesis 3.10, quote, Although this seems to be the confession of a, ge of a dejected and humble man, it will nevertheless soon appear that he was not yet properly subdued, nor led to repentance. He imputes his fear to the voice of God and to his own nakedness, as if he had never before heard God speaking without being alarmed and had not been even sweetly exhilarated by his speech. His excessive stupidity appears in this that he fails to recognize the cause of shame in his sin. He, therefore, shows that he does not yet so feel his punishment as to confess his fault. In the meantime, he proves what I said before to be true, that original sin does not reside in one part of the body only, mm. but holds its dominion over the whole man, and so occupies every part of the soul that none remains in its integrity. For notwithstanding his fig leaves, he still dreads the presence of God, unquote. That was John Calvin, John Calvin mincing no words uh, with regard to Adam's response to God in Genesis chapter 3, verse 10. Now, I find the latter part of that commentary by Calvin, that notwithstanding his fig leaves, 
he still dreads the presence of God. That is, Adam still dreads the presence of God. To be a particularly interesting statement, Omaha, because in my mind anyway, Calvin's words should prompt each of us to examine our own heart so as to determine if the fear and anxiety we may be experiencing isn't in fact rooted in some sin in our life that we've refused to deal truthfully with God about. Mm, That's good. In other words, like Adam and Eve, we've covered our sin with fig leaves, so to speak, instead of genuinely confessing them and turning away from them in our heart. Now, I say that in light of this passage in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, where the Apostle Paul writes this, Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose, because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, Mm -hmm. so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. So Peter is saying here in 1 Peter 4, verses 1 and 2, those who in Christ have ceased uh, uh, living a life of practiced sin, of habitual sin, and that as such, we are to live the rest of our time in the flesh, in this world, in our bodies, no longer for ourselves, but for carrying out the will of God. Now consider those words of the Apostle Peter in light of these words from the British theologian Arthur Walkington Pink. A.W. Pink. A.W. Pink said this, quote, Every privilege of the gospel entails an added obligation upon its recipient. As creatures, it is our bounden duty to be in entire subjection to our creator. As new creatures in Christ, it doubly behooves us to serve God cheerfully. It is a great mistake to suppose that grace sets aside the claims of righteousness or that the law of God demands less from the saved than it does from the unsaved, unquote. That was A.W. Pink. So again, the point here is that as professing believers in Jesus Christ, each of us would do well to consistently examine ourselves to ensure that our heart is right before God and that there is no unconfessed sin in our life so that our fellowship with him is not broken or, or strained. Each of us should echo the words of the prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 12, verse 3. But you know me, O Lord, you see me, and you examine my heart's attitude toward you. And then these words from the psalmist in Psalm 66, verse 18. If I regard wickedness in my heart, the Lord will not hear. Mm. Thoughts, Omaha? Yeah, what you shared in this section, man, is just another angle on on what I kind of laid out with the the Puritan prayer. The source of, of much of our sinful fear and anxiety is that we think far too much of ourselves. And can you imagine how little our concern would be for the world if we would but focus on our need for repentance before a holy God? Instead, we often act as if we are the center of the universe and we must order all things accordingly. Like the Puritans, man, if we listened to and obeyed scripture, we would shift our focus more properly toward God. Man, I like the simple truth found in the gospel of Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, which reads, but seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. While Paul was speaking, uh, as he's writing the, the church at Philippi, he's actually speaking of his eternal reward. And, and I'm reminded of his words in this context when he said, not, not that I've already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ has made me his own. Verse 13, brothers, I do not consider that I've made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Now, again, Paul in that instance was thinking about his eternal reward, but it behooves the believer in Christ to think about two things. One, their need for repentance before a holy God, and then moving forward, pressing on toward the mark of God, toward the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. A focus in that regard, rather than on all of the world's trappings, will have us in the right frame of mind to be dealing rightly with issues of fear and anxiety. That's what I've got for that section, brother. That's great thoughts, Omaha. You know, I want to revisit something that I touched on earlier And that is that sinful fear and anxiety begin in the mind. And when I say mind, I mean in the heart. Uh, As Dr. A. Craig Troxell, 
professor of practical theology at Westminster Seminary in California, writes in his book titled With All Your Heart, subtitled Orient- Orienting Your Mind, Desires, and Will Toward Christ, says this, Dr. A. Craig Troxell, I'm quoting from his book, With All Your Heart, Orienting Your Mind, Desires, and Will Toward Christ. Quote, Our intellectual life is constantly intrigued with darker musings and deeper motives. Our imagination flirts with reckless fantasies that are rooted in self-indulgence and delusion. Our memories, buried years ago, are conjured up for their revisited pleasure. Our secret thoughts are laced throughout with mischievous designs. None of these are actually seen or heard, but they are all too real. So much of our sin is first conceived by lust, jealousy, bitterness, self-pity, or anger. We pursue these sinful reveries and ambitions with full knowledge that God denounces such evil, even in its contemplation. But we are accountable for what we know. And so much of our sin begins here, in the mind of the heart. I love how he phrased that. Mm -hmm. Much of our sin begins in the mind of the heart, Dr. Troxell says. Continuing to quote Dr. Troxell, The mind, whether fallen or reborn, is always biased, motivated, and impassioned by the state of the heart in general. This should not surprise us. Remember, the word heart is used in Scripture first and foremost to refer to the unity of our inner self. The mind, the desires, and the will are distinct functions of the heart, but they are not separate or unrelated. Mm. They constantly influence and relate to one another. This is the way the heart was meant to operate, with knowledge, affection, and volition working with each other. What the heart enjoys is what the heart will explore. Mm. Let me say that again. What the heart enjoys is what the heart will explore. All our knowledge is ethical and has an agenda. The mind is always interpreting, unquote. Mm. Wow. That was Dr. A. Craig Troxell from his book, With All Your Heart, subtitled Orienting Your Mind, Desires, and Will Toward Christ. So for the Christian, sinful fear and anxiety is the fruit of a mind that, as Dr. Troxell said, is semper interpretationum, Mm. always interpreting. The mind, Dr. Troxell said, is always interpreting. Fear and anxiety are a byproduct of a mind and heart that has abdicated and ceded to our sinful flesh territory that was previously occupied by a firm trust in God and in his word. Now, this in my mind, Omaha, begs the question, in what or in whom are you actually placing your trust to begin with? That's good. Hello. In what or in whom are you placing your trust to begin with? Now, I realize that question may seem to be somewhat of a dagger to the heart or perhaps better to the conscience. But I offer that inquiry against the backdrop of these challenging yet encouraging words from the late Dr. Jerry Bridges who in his book titled Trusting God said this, quote, To set the Lord before me is to recognize his presence and his constant help. But this is something we must choose to do. Mm. God is always with us. He has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. That's Hebrews 13, 5. There is no question of his presence with us, but we must recognize his presence. We must set him always before us. We must choose whether or not we will believe his promises of constant protection and care. We must know that God is sovereign, wise, and loving. But having been exposed to the knowledge of the truth, we must then choose whether to believe the truth about God, which he has revealed to us, or whether to follow our feelings. Hello. Dr. Bridges says we must choose whether to believe the truth about God or whether to follow our feelings. Bridges concludes with this, if we are to trust God, we must choose to believe his truth. We must say, I will trust you, though I do not feel like doing so. Wow. Unquote. That's good. Wow. Yeah. Those words from Bridges remind me of how dangerous it is to allow ourselves to fall prey to our feelings and emotions, which we're so susceptible to 
in those moments when fear and anxiety set in to disbelieve the God in whom we've entrusted our eternal destiny. I mean, think about it, Omaha. You profess to be a Christian, someone who by definition has entrusted to a God you've never seen your eternal future, right. yet you cannot trust him with the next five minutes right. of that right. situation or circumstance you're right. dealing with or concerned about. That'll preach. That'll preach. I mean, think about that. Yep. Think about that as I quote the following words from Dr. Richard Caldwell. Dr. Caldwell is pastor of Founders Baptist Church in Spring, Texas, quoting from his book titled Answering Anxiety, subtitled A Biblical Answer for What Troubles Your Heart. Answering, as, answering Anxiety, A Biblical Answer for What Troubles Your Heart. I'm quoting Dr. Richard Caldwell, quote, When we worry, when we are full of anxiety, what we are dealing with is a pride problem. Mm -hmm. Until we stop thinking that we handle us better than God handles us, until we stop thinking that he really doesn't know or that he really isn't in control or that he really doesn't care about us, until our minds and hearts change about that and we put away our pride, we are actually shutting ourselves off from God's help. So the answer to anxiety is as simple as this one word, humility. The problem with the trouble-filled heart is pride. The answer for that pride is repentance. The answer for anxiety is repentance that recognizes the evil, okay? The answer for anxiety is the repentance that recognizes the evil of not trusting God's care for us. It's the repentance of those who choose instead, listen to this, it's the repentance of those who choose instead to preach the truth of God's faithfulness to their own hearts and minds. That's good, man. Unquote. That's good. That was powerful. That, that was Dr. Good. Richard Caldwell again yep. from his book, Answering Anxiety, A Biblical Answer for What Troubles Your Heart. Mm -hmm. Now, Omaha, I think Dr. Caldwell's words reveal to us a, a, a spiritual reality that we don't often want to acknowledge when it comes to this matter of sinful fear and anxiety. And that reality is this. We don't often regard fear and anxiety as being sinful to begin with. Right, right. In fact, I would venture to say, Omaha, that there are many professing Christians today who see worry and anxiety as virtuous. Yes. Having convinced themselves that worrying or being anxious, especially about someone, such as a child or a spouse, is evidence that you care deeply about that person. But as Lou Priolo, director of biblical counseling at Valleydale Church in Birmingham, Alabama, and a fellow of the Association of Certified Biblical Counselors writes in his book titled Fear, Breaking Its Grips. Lu, Lu Priolo says this, quote, If you are a fearful person, you undoubtedly have some idea of how destructive fear can be. It is essential, however, that you understand that above and beyond the misery that sinful fear produces, it is truly offensive to God, mm. unquote. That was Lou, Dr. Lou Priolo from his book, Fear, subtitled Breaking Its Grip. Now, to revisit my earlier point, and I say this in the spirit of Ephesians 14, 415 rather, Ephesians 415, speaking the truth and love. Worry, fear, and anxiety are not indicators of care and concern, my friend. They're actually indicators of idolatry. Now, to help expand on that point, I want to quote a fairly lengthy passage from the book titled, When People Are Big, and God is Small, subtitled Overcoming Peer Pressure, Codependency, and the Fear of Man by Dr. Edward T. Welch. Now, as I said, Omaha, this is a somewhat lengthy passage that I'm about to quote, so I'm asking our listeners to please bear with me on this one. In chapter three of uh, Dr. Welch's book, When People Are Big and God is Small, chapter three titled People Will Reject Me, Dr. Welch writes this, quote, when we think of idols, we usually think first of Baal, and other material man-made cre creations. Next, we might think of money. We rarely picture our spouse, our children, or a friend from school. But people are our idol of choice. They predate Baal, money, and power. Like all idols, people are created things, not the creator. That's Romans 125. And they do not deserve our worship. They are worshipped because we perceive that they have power to give us something. Mm. We think they can bless us. When you think of it, idolatry is the age-old strategy of the human heart. The objects of worship may change over time, 
but the heart stays the same. What we do now is no different from what the Israelites did with the golden calf. When the Israelites left Egypt, they felt very vulnerable and needy and were hard-hearted and rebellious. Even though they had witnessed the power of God, they felt afraid. They felt out of control. Their remedy was to choose an idol over the true God. By doing this, they were both opposing God and avoiding Him. They opposed God by trusting in themselves and in their own gods rather than the true God. After all, they couldn't be absolutely certain that God was going to bless the women with fertility. And what about these other gods that seem to have power to give abundant crops? Just in case God wasn't enough, they started to follow other gods. They thought the idols would give them what they wanted or felt they needed. They wanted a God they could control and manipulate. They wanted nothing above themselves, including God. God, they thought, would not be able to keep pace with their desires. And so they looked for blessing and satisfaction in something they felt they could control. They wanted to do it their way rather than God's. That is the height of rebellion. So it is today. In our unbelief, we oppose God and avoid him. What is the result of this people idolatry? As in all history, the idol we choose to worship soon owns us. The object we fear overcomes us. Although insignificant in itself, the idol becomes huge and rules us. It tells us how to think, what to feel, and how to act. It tells us what to wear. It tells us to laugh at the dirty joke. And it tells us to be frightened to death when we might have to get up in front of a group and say something. The whole strategy backfires. We never expect that using people to meet our desires leaves us enslaved to them. Wow. Unquote. That was Dr. Ed Welch from his amazing book titled When People Are Big and God Is Small, Overcoming Peer Pressure, Codependency, and the Fear of Man. Omaha, what you got? Man, right at this point, I mean, there's a library of materials and resources that, that we've quoted from that people can go back and take a deeper look at. I mean, as I mean, just in this section alone, as I reflect upon the the quote that you use from Jerry, uh, from yeah, from Jerry Bridges, it, it reminds me of of Proverbs three five and six, which says, "Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Do not lean to your own understanding, and all your ways acknowledge Him, and He'll make straight your paths." Uh, the quote from Doctor Richard Caldwell, uh, Caldwell reminds me of the verse of Scripture in Philippians four six, where Paul writes, "Do not be anxious about anything." But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. This last section, bro, that you just did, there were so many thoughts and so many connections that were kind of firing off in my head with regard to how we don't trust God and, 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 and how when we, when we don't trust God, we begin to look for idols that we can control uh, in an effort to, to manage, maintain, and structure our life's situation. I mean, that's we're seeing that in, 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 the, in the CRT debate. We're seeing, I mean, every facet of life, we're seeing that in the gender issue. I mean, every facet of life, we're seeing these kinds of things uh, happen as a result. And so that, that last quote was just so spot on. But I'm also reminded, uh, as you read from, from Edward Welch, reminded of the quote by John Calvin when he said that the the human heart is a perpetual idol factory, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, we, we, we know how to make idols out of near about anything. And, uh, and, and we're doing that with regard to this issue of sinful fear and anxiety. But Scripture is clearly and constantly reminding us to fear not. Theologians have recounted that the phrase fear not has been mentioned some 356 times in the Bible and the whole of Scripture. And while we're instructed to fear God— we are not to be afraid of other circumstances that the world has to offer. It's as if God in his word, as, as he writes in, in scripture, wants, wants to clearly reveal that the expressions that we have of fear is only to adequately be expressed about and for God himself. You know, could, it, could it be that whatever else we might find ourselves fearing, we've elevated to the position that only God should hold? You know, I, I agree with John Calvin when he said that the human heart is a perpetual idol factory. Again, current culture 
is engaged in an ever-increasing idolatrous act of self-worship. Let me say that again. Culture is currently engaged in an ever-increasing idolatrous act of self-worship. We see this in everything from selfie culture to gender confusion to the bowed knee at the golden calf of ethnicity. Everything is actually all about me. While this is true of culture, it should not be true of the follower of Christ. Our comfort, our peace should be found in an understanding of whose we are and ultimately what our end is, and that is eternity with Christ. Uh, it's here, man, that I find the Heidelberg Catechism helpful uh, in this, and, and the very first question that it asks and answers. And so I, I, thought to, I thought to leverage it here in this space for the purpose of the listener trying to apply something practical that they can think about, meditate on, and, and walk through all of this again sourced with Scripture. The very first question uh, in the Heidelberg Catechism asks, what is your only comfort in life and in death? And, and the answer is this, that I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death. To my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all of my sins with his precious blood, and he has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. Because I belong to him, Christ by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. I think things like that, questions and answers like that, be it a catechism, uh, be it the, the books that we've referenced, uh, all of these things can help us in the times that we find ourselves in when we're fearful about matters of, of life, of culture, the fallen world in which we live to properly have fear aimed rightly at God, uh, having, having a proper fear of the Lord, and an understanding that if we are His, all things work together to our benefit. Man. That's what I've Omaha, that's beautiful, bro. Amen, yeah. bro. Thank you for that. You know, over the next several minutes, Omaha, I want to take our listeners back to a book I quoted from earlier in this episode. It was John Flavel's Triumphing Over Sinful Fear. Mm -hmm. John Flavel was a 17th century pure, uh, English Puritan. I want to go back to that book for the next several minutes. And in chapter four of Flavel's book, Triumphing Over Sinful Fear, titled Causes of Sinful Fear, Flavel lists six primary causes of sinful fear in believers. But of those six, Flavel argues that one is the fundamental root cause above all the others. Mm. So I'm going to go through these six causes of sinful fear as John Flavel lays them out in his book, Triumphing Over Sinful Fear, chapter four titled Causes of Sinful Fear. Cause number one, ignorance. Flavel says this, quote, The sinful fear of most good people arises from their ignorance, the darkness of their minds. All darkness inclines to fear, but none like intellectual darkness. First, we are ignorant of God. We do not know, or at least we do not fully consider, His mighty power, vigilant care, unspotted faithfulness, and how these are engaged by covenant for his people. If we thoroughly understand and believe what power is in God's hand to defend us, what tenderness is in his heart to help us, and what faithfulness is in his promises, our hearts will be calm, our courage will grow stronger, and our fear will grow weaker, unquote. So that was John Flavel, cause number one, ignorance. Cause number two, according to Flavel's book, triumphing over sinful fear, guilt. Flavel says this, quote, Another cause and fountain of sinful fear is a guilty conscience. A servant of sin is necessarily a slave of fear. Those who commit evil must expect evil. As soon as Adam defiled and wounded his conscience with guilt, he trembled and hid himself. It is the same way with his children. God calls to Adam not with threats, but with gentle words, not in a storm, but in the cool of the day. Even so, it terrifies Adam because his conscience condemns him. Mm. Genesis 3.8 Seneca, a Roman philosopher, 
observes that a guilty conscience acts as a terrible torment to the sinner, perpetually lashing him with fears. He does not know where to find security. He dares not trust in any promise, promises of protection. He doubts. He is jealous of everything. He has a, quote, dreadful sound in his ears, unquote. That's Job 15, 21, meaning he suffers the effects of real and imaginary dangers. His troubled imagination scares him, even when there is no real danger. The wicked flee when no one is pursuing, but the righteous are as bold as a lion, Proverbs 28, 1. An evil and guilty conscience produces fears and terrors in three ways. One, it aggregates small matters, blowing them up to the height of the most fatal and destructive evils. A guilty conscience gives a person a view of his enemy through a magnifying glass. I love, I like that, man. That was awesome. Mm-hmm. Level says a guilty conscience gives a person a view of his enemy through a, a magnifying glass. Mm-hmm. Number two of those three ways. It interprets all doubtful cases in the worst possible c- sense. So Flavel's saying right here that uh, uh, a guilty conscience produces fear in, in that uh, the, the, the person who has the guilty conscience, conscience they're always thinking of worst case scenario. Yes. What, what, the worst that can happen is always yes. worst case scenario. Yep. Then number three, Flavel says it creates fears and terrors out of nothing. In arithmetic, many zeros make zero. The rules of fear, however, are not like that. It can make something out of nothing, many and great things out of nothing at all. So that was reason number two for causes of sinful fear and anxiety. First was ignorance. Second was guilt. Now, third is unbelief. This is the hammer. This is the one that Flavel says is worse than than all the others. Unbelief, Flavel says this, quote, a guilty conscience is a source of fears but the sin of unbelief is the real and proper cause of most distracting and afflicting fears. To the extent that our souls are empty of faith, they will be filled with fear. If people were to dig to the root of their fears, they would find unbelief. The weaker the faith, the greater the fear. Unbelief generates fear and fear strengthens unbelief. In nature, there is an observable circular generation. Vapors produce showers and showers produce vapors. It is the same way in moral things. All the skill in the world cannot cure us of the, of the disease of fear. God must first cure us of our unbelief. Christ took the right method to rid his disciples of their fear when he rebuked them for their unbelief. Mark sixteen fourteen. The remnant of this sin in God's people is the fountain of their fears. As for how unbelief generates fear, consider the following points. First, unbelief weakens the assenting act of faith. In so doing, it severs the soul from its principal relief against danger and trouble. It is the office of faith to impress upon the soul the invisible things of the world to come thereby encouraging it against the fears and dangers of this present world. Second, unbelief severs the soul from its refuge in the divine promises. In so doing, it leaves the soul in the hand of fears and terrors. In evil times, a Christian is fortified and emboldened by his dependence upon God for protection. I flee unto thee to hide me. Psalm 143, verse 9. The removal of this refuge, which only unbelief can do, deprives the soul of all the help and support that God's promises supply. As a result, it fills the heart with fear and anxiety. Mm-hmm. Unquote. So that was reason three of the, a cost number three, rather, of the six causes of sinful fear. That Flavel mentions now. Let, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me let me interject one thing. Go, in, go, go ahead, V. Go ahead. In there, in that is what you just shared there. If, if people understand the nature of what's being said there, that if someone is truly in unbelief and they have this kind of experience with regard to fear, this is the kind of thing that 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 the end result is usually death of the person who who, who has yes. that fear. 
this yeah. this is this is where this is where you find folks have committed suicide or or because they, they have no other place to go and their their thought right. is I've got to hide myself and rather than hiding right. in God they they simply end their lives. That's where that's where this that's Great. where this ends up leading. Excellent point there, Omaha. Um, okay, cause number four, according to John Flavel, is confusion. Okay, confusion. Cause number four. Flavel says this quote. The administration of God's providence in the world provokes many of our fears. All things come alike to all. There is one event to the righteous and one to the wicked, to the good and to the clean and to the unclean, to him that sacrifices and to him that sacrifices not. That's Ecclesiastes 9 verse 2. The sword makes no difference where God has made a difference by grace. Mm. It does not distinguish between faces or hearts. It is as soon plunged into the hearts of the best as the worst people. The revolving of these and other considerations in our thoughts and the mixing of our own unbelief with them creates a world of fear, even in good people. This continues until we resign everything to God, setting our faith upon his promises, which assure us of his sanctification of our troubles. That's Romans 8.28. His presence with us in our troubles, that's Psalm 92, 15. His moderation of our troubles to a degree we can endure, mm -hmm. that's Isaiah 26, 8. And his final deliverance of us from our troubles, that's Revelation 7, verse 17. In this way, we rescue our hearts from our fear and compose them to a quiet and sweet satisfaction in the wise and holy pleasure of of our God, unquote. Okay, so that was cause number four, confusion. Cause number five, according to John Flavel, is immoderation. Immoderation. Flavel says this, quote, our immoderate love of life and its comforts and conveniences is another cause of sinful fear in times of danger. If we loved our lives less, we would fear and tremble less. It is said of those renowned saints, quote, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. They overcame their enemies' fury from without and their sinful fears from within. They achieved this victory through death to the inordinate and immoderate love of life. Certainly their fears would have overcome them if they had not first overcome their love of life. It is not, therefore, without great reason that our Lord commands his disciples to hate their own lives. Mm. That's Luke 14, 26. Not absolutely, but in comparison to their love for him. We are to esteem our lives as poor, lowly things in comparison to our love for him. He knew what suffering would come upon them. If the immoderate love of life were not overcome and mortified, it would make them bend under such temptations. That is what freed Paul from slavish fear and made him so undaunted. Mm. Although he suffered hard things, he had less fear than his friends who only sympathized with him in his suffering. He spoke like a spectator rather than a sufferer, declaring, none of these things move me. Acts 20 verse 24. How did he obtain such courage and constancy of mind in the midst of such deep and dreadful suffering. His suffering was enough to move the bravest person in the world and to remove the resolution of anyone who did not love Christ more than life. But in comparison to Jesus Christ, life was a trifle to Paul. He tells us, neither count I my life dear unto myself. That's Acts 20, 24. In other words, it is a commodity of little value in my eyes not worth saving on such sinful terms. Oh, how many have parted with Christ, peace, and eternal life for fear of losing what Paul so little regarded. If we bring our thoughts nearer the matter, we will find that this is a fountain of fear in times of danger. From this excessive love of life, we are racked and tortured with 10,000 terrors. Why? Unquote. That was Flavel with cause number five of sinful fear and anxiety, which he calls immoderation. And then number six, number six of the six causes of fear and moderation, according to John Flavel, Satan, Satan, quote, 
Many of our sinful fears flow from Satan's influence upon our imaginations. It is said that Satan raises winds and storms, both by sea and land. I have never doubted that the prince of the power of the air, by God's permission, can put the world into great frights and disturbances by such tempests. as Job chapter 1 verse 19. He can raise the loftiest winds, pour down roaring showers, rattle in the air with fearful claps of thunder, and scare the lower world with terrible flashes of lightning. I do not doubt that he has, by God's permission, a great deal of influence upon people's imaginations and passions. He can raise far more terrible storms and tempests within than we ever felt without. Mm -hmm. He can approach our imaginations, disturbing them with frightful ideas. If God gives him permission, he is ready to do it seeing as it is so conductible to his design. By putting men into such frights, he weakens their hands in duty. If he prevails, he drives them into temptation's snare as the fishermen and fowlers trap birds and fish in their nets, having flushed them out of the woods. Unquote. So again, according to John Flavel in his book, Overcoming Sinful Fear, Triumphing Rather Over Sinful Fear, Those are the six primary causes of sinful fear, ignorance, guilt, unbelief, which he says is really the worst of all, confusion, immoderation, and Satan. Thoughts, Omaha? And this was a powerful section that you walked through, and and I'm going to encourage our listeners um, to go back through this section. Uh, Just mark it, you know, even, even stop the recording right here, go back and mark it. And take down some of what's here. And the reason I, I want to encourage that is because, as Daryl, as you walk through this particular section, uh, and you, you know how, how I operate. One of the first things I try to do is I try to take it and use this as a mirror and examine my own heart and life and mind. And, and I can see that in every area where there's been sinful fear uh, and anxiety, that one or more of these, these, uh, these six areas were evidence uh, in my own life, um, s- some more, some more than others, right? Whether it was ignorance, yeah, it, it's like, go ahead. It's like we've said. It's like we've often said on the on the Just Thinking podcast, Omaha, that the Word of God is both a mirror and a window. Absolutely, okay? Scripture is both a mirror and a window, but it is first a mirror, absolutely, then a window. It is absolutely. first a mirror for you to see yourself. Yeah, then it's a window to look outwardly and see everything else. Yeah. So as I as I as I look at these, I'm I'm thinking, okay, the areas of ignorance, yep, that's been me. Guilt, absolutely. Unbelief, that's been me at different times. Confusion, immoderation, and even Satan. And and I and my my argument with the issue with with Satan's influences, and it, it is upon the imagination. It's not that he's out there, you know, arranging things in such a way. I'm not that important. Right. He's not arranging things in such a way that that something happens to me. But I can say. That the imaginations of my own mind, uh, and again with 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 the influence of of our enemy, uh, has right. really created tremendous problems for me to the degree that you become handcuffed in your bold witness and your bold proclamation and and what mm-hmm. it is you'd want to do on behalf of the Lord. And, and I would I would say, man, it is incumbent upon us as believers in Christ who who've been commissioned to go out and represent Him. Uh, in, 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 a, in a world that's growing ever more dark, we have a responsibility to rid ourselves of anything that encumbers us, of anything mm-hmm. that entangles us, mm-hmm. of anything that ensnares us. So one of the things that you've recognized is that while we've been talking about the issue of sinful fear and anxiety, we've also constantly been pushing the theme of repentance. Yes, of repentance. If you if you've been p- paying close attention to what's been happening, whether whether it's a big section that that Daryl reads, he'll land on the page of how important it is for us to, to to repent. And if that's not been the case, I've either circled back and given you a prayer about our own sin and how we can repent of it, because a lot of what we're experiencing is a direct result of our, of of sin in our own lives, and we have to acknowledge where that's the case and when that's happening. What happens in culture can stir that up to our mind to, to a degree that we're really uh, we're, we're, we're really uh, paralyzed by what we're by what we're seeing and experiencing. And I would argue that many believers are finding themselves in that very same condition. So I, I'm, it's interesting. I agree with with Flavel on the six points that he makes. 
Uh, you know, you've got to also keep in mind, and, and and I'll get right back to my notes here with this comment. Keep in mind that that Flava was born in 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 sixteen uh, twenty seven, I believe, and died in sixteen ninety one. Now, now contrast that with what what you and the listener may be fearing or anxious about. Think about his time frame as he's writing these things, and then think about our time frame. I went and looked at a list of the top ten things that people in our day are actually afraid of. I, I, I found an article, Daryl, that looked at the 2020, 2020, the top 10 things that people fear. Let me give you a list of what those things are or were. Go for it, bro. They were the coronavirus, the election results, racism, CRT and education, the vaccine. And at that time, with regard to the vaccine, they were concerned if, if we would actually have one by December, as was originally promised. Now it's a whole different set of concerns about the, about the vaccine. Uh, they were concerned about death and dying. There's a lot of talk around, about death and dying. Concerned culturally about issues around Black Lives Matter, about change and transition. Now, if there's anything you can guarantee will be happening, change and transition will indeed happen. But that was what was on the, 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 the minds of people in, in, uh, in 2020 as a, as a top 10. The last thing, uh, last two things, health. And then the, the final thing, number 10, was divorce and abuse, divorce and abuse. And a lot of this had to do with people who were living together in close proximity because of you know uh, the mandates of the government and, and divorce at right. the time was actually on the rise. And, and these are just the top 10. Now, as we think about our current cultural context, I want to challenge our listeners to maybe take a notepad, write down the things that you're afraid of or have are causing you anxiety, and then go back through the list that, uh, that, that you just walked through, Daryl, in your commentary, mm-hmm. the six top things that that we that, that, that you examined from from that book and and in that way I'm, I'm, I, we need to ask ourselves a question in what ways here's the question we need to ask in what ways am I responding to this issue that I'm fearful about based upon ignorance guilt mm-hmm. unbelief confusion immoderation or the devices of the enemy that, mm-hmm. That's the question that we excellent have, counsel, bro. have excellent to counsel. ask ourselves. I, I seriously believe that if we can identify how we are wrongly responding, we can then repent and respond biblically through the lens of faith in God that the scripture prescribes. That was excellent counsel there, bro. Appreciate that, Omaha. You know, as I reflect on what we've covered thus far in this episode of the Just Thinking Podcast on the very weighty topic of sinful fear and anxiety, I'm truly humble when I pause to consider that our merciful and gracious God has left his people with his word, mm. the Holy Scriptures, which are altogether sufficient. Mm-hmm. To, and this is exactly the point you were making just a second ago, that scripture is altogether sufficient to help us navigate these waters of sinful fear and anxiety that we might experience in this corrupt world in which we live. But the question we have to answer, the question we have to answer as professing believers in Christ, Omaha, is this. Do I believe that for myself? Right, right, right. Do do I believe that God's word is sufficient to help me navigate through this? Mm -hmm. You see, I can help you walk through what the word of God says about how to deal with sinful fear and anxiety, but I can't believe God's word for you. Right. You have to believe God's word for yourself. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, I can, ex- I can exhort you to believe the truths of God's word and to the best of my ability, I've done that on this episode. And yet the fact remains that believing God's word is a decision you have to make in your own mind and heart. I Absolutely. cannot make that decision for you. Yep. It's like the man in John chapter five, verses five and six, who had been ill for 38 years. Jesus asked the man, do you wish to get well? See, perhaps that question resonates with someone who's listening to me right now. Do you wish to get well? Do you truly desire to overcome sinful fear and anxiety in your life? If you are wavering in doubt and uncertainty about whether you can trust God and his word in the particular situation or circumstance in which you're feeling fearful and anxious, I would point you to these encouraging yet very sobering words from the Apostle James in James chapter 1, verses 5 through 8, in which he gives us a promise, then a warning, then another promise, okay? Okay. James writes this in James 1, verses 5 through 8. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. That's a promise. Now, 
Here comes the warning. Verse 6, but he must ask in faith without any doubting. Here's the warning. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. And let me just interject here that those words driven and tossed by the wind take us back to Matthew 8, 26 and the mindset of the, of the disciples as they were panicking as the boat that they had, that they and Jesus were in was being driven and tossed by the waves. Okay, that's, that's that picture that James is talking about here. You're being driven and tossed just like a boat in a storm. James continues, but he must ask in faith without any doubting. Well, the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. And now comes the second promise. This is a negative promise, if, you, if, if I may put it that way. Uh -huh. Well, that man ought not to expect to receive anything from the Lord, uh -huh. being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So if you come to God doubting, you shouldn't expect God to, give, to, 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 to respond to you. That's not going to happen. You can't be double-minded. Okay, you can't be double-minded. If you are, if that's you, if you fit, fit in any one or more of those six categories of causes of fear that, that I uh, noted earlier from John Flavel and then that Virgil just gave you excellent biblical counseling on, you need to repent of that. You need to repent of that. Ask God to mortify that within you. Okay? Now, let's pair that passage in James 1, verses 5 through 8. With these words from Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, where we read this, And without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Now, that one verse brings to our mind again the words of Dr. R.C. Sproul, <clears throat> who said this. R.C. Sproul said this, There is a difference in believing in God mm. and believing God. Yes. Right? Yes. Hello. RC said there is a difference in believe, believing in God and believing God. So the writer of Hebrews is saying to us, Omaha, that it's not enough for you and I to merely come to God in the sense that we believe God exists. Mm -hmm. That's the easy part. Mm -hmm. But we must come to God in full expectation that he will graciously meet our needs. That's believing God. Mm -hmm. And admittedly, that's not always easy for finite and changeable sinners like us to do. So there's a difference, R.C. Sproul is saying, <clears throat> between believing in God and believing God. Listen to this passage from Mark chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. Jesus went out from there and came into his hometown, and his disciples followed him. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue. And the many listeners, note that phrase, many listeners, the, li the many listeners were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? And what is this wisdom given to him and such miracles as these performed by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they, and they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own hometown and among his own relatives and in his own household. And he could do no miracle there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he wondered at their unbelief. Mm. He wondered at their unbelief. Now, that word wondered in Mark chapter 6, verse 6, is a Greek verb, thumazo, T H A U M A Z O, thumazo. It means that Jesus wasn't simply puzzled at their unbelief, as if he were curious as to why the people didn't believe he was the Messiah. No, that Greek word, thumazo, translated means that Jesus was amazed. He was astonished at their unbelief, so much so that he performed no great miracles right there in his own hometown. Now, my point is this. That passage in Mark 6 tells us that Jesus had many listeners, but not many believers. Hello, Jesus had many listeners but he didn't have many believers. If you're a professing Christian who is listening to this episode of the Just Thinking Podcast, what you must understand is that nothing that I or Virgil have said or will say will do you any good whatsoever in your struggling with sinful fear and anxiety apart from your willingness to believe the word of God for yourself. That's good. As the psalmist asks introspectively in Psalm 43 verse 5, why are you in despair, O my soul? And why are you disturbed within me? Hope in God, 
for I shall again praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. And in Psalm, and if, if Psalm 43, 5 happens to not be where you are attitudinally speaking right now, then I urge you not to be ashamed to pray as the man did in Mark chapter 9, verse 24. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And that, that's good counsel. That's good counsel. All right. So if you're not, if your mind and heart are not uh, uh, attitudinally in the place where the psalmist wrote in Psalm 43, 5, don't be too proud to pray Mark 9, 24. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. As the great English minister of the 19th century, John Charles Ryrie, J.C. Ryle, I'm sorry, John Charles Ryle said this in his excellent book, Practical Religion. If you've not read Practical Religion, shame on you. Get a copy, Practical Religion by J.C. Ryle. Hmm? J.C. Ryle says this in the chapter titled Happiness, quote, there are degrees of grace and degrees of faith. Those who have the most faith and grace will have the most happiness. But all, more or less, compared to the children of the world, are happy men. Do I say that real true Christians are equally happy at all times? No, not for a moment. All have their ebbs and flows of comfort. Their bodily health is not always the same. Their earthly circumstances are not always the same. The souls of those they love fill them at seasons with special anxiety. And they themselves are sometimes overtaken by a fault and a walk in darkness. They sometimes give way to inconsistencies and besetting sins and lose their sense of pardon. But as a general rule, the true Christian has a deep pool of peace within him, which even at the lowest is never entirely dry. The true Christian is the only happy man because he has sources of happiness entirely independent of this world. He has something which cannot be affected by sickness and by deaths by private losses, and by public calamities. The peace of God which passes all understanding. He has a hope laid up for him in heaven. He has a treasure which moth and rust cannot corrupt. He has a house which can never be taken down. His loving wife may die, and his heart feel torn in two. His darling children may be taken from him, and he may be left alone in this cold world. His earthly plans may be crossed. His health may fail, but all this time he has a portion which nothing can hurt. Mm. He has one friend who never dies. He has possessions beyond the grave of which nothing can deprive him. This is real happiness. Mm. Unquote. That was J.C. Ryle from his book, Practical Religion and the chapter title, Happiness. Omaha Thoughts, bro. Now that was really good. I I concur with what you what you stated earlier about making sure that in your library is J.C. Ryle's book, The uh, Practical Religion, and uh, it 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 should definitely be uh, on your uh, you know on your radar screen. If you haven't read it, it should definitely be in your library for sure. The last quote from from Ryle reminds me of the story. It automatically went in my mind to the story of Horatio Spatford. You know this story well, I'm sure. Yep, Darryl. yep, yep. We quoted that story in an episode. Yep, yep. It's the story. Well, I'll retell it here to some degree. It's the story of, of the lawyer Horatio Spatford, who tragically lost his son to scarlet fever and much of his business during the Chicago fire of 1871. Now, planning to send his wife and his four daughters on a vacation, on a much needed vacation, uh, he puts them on a, on a boat, uh, on, a, on an ocean liner, and sends them across the Atlantic. And unfortunately, the ship is involved in a collision where more than 200 people died, including Horatio Spatford's daughters. Spatford's daughters. Horatio's wife makes it to land and sends word back to him via telegram saying, quote, saved alone, what shall I do, end quote. Mm-hmm. Now, Horatio would get on a boat and travel to his wife. During the trip, uh, we, we were told that he would, he would, he was actually told rather, uh, while he was on this trip, the place at which his daughters and hundreds of other people had died, uh, and it was sometime thereafter that he would pen the words to a very familiar song that goes this way, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well 
with my soul. Next verse. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ hath regarded my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. Next verse is this. My sin, O the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. The, the, the preceding verses would be added toward the end uh, of this writing, but this is a story that, uh, that, that needs to be, we need to be reminded of. And when we sing the great hymns of the church on the Lord's Day, uh, they have rich depth of theology mm-hmm. in them. There's a clarity of thought about the nature of who God is and the nature of who we are, and that even in some sometimes tragic uh, settings, tragic surroundings, if we but focus on the goodness of God, even in those situations, uh, we can find our way through that process uh, as a result. What's often not told about this story is that Horatio after reuniting with his wife, and uh, th- that they would actually have two more children. Now, this never replaces those who were lost, but allows us to see that even in this tragedy, uh, triumph takes place as the next generation is exposed to the glories of God through the life of this man. Yeah, I'll, I'll never tire of hearing that story, Yeah, uh, Omaha. That was really solid. You know, and as you were reading those uh, lyrics, <clears throat> you were reading those words, I couldn't help but think about uh, those words up against some of the shallow, hollow, (laughs) so-called worship music that uh, many churches uh, have bought into these days. Yep. Uh, Man, so thanks for sharing that, bro. You know, in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 and 13, the Apostle Peter gives us this exhortation. He says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exultation. That was 1 Peter 4, verses 12 and 13. The Apostle Paul, in 2 Corinthians 4, verses 7 through 11, and then in verse 15 of that chapter, says this, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. For all things are for your sakes, so that the grace which is spreading to more and more people may cause the giving of thanks to abound to the glory of God. Now, to summarize those two passages in 1 Peter 4 and 2 Corinthians 4, the situation or circumstance about which you find yourself being anxious and fearful, provided those situations and circumstances are not merely the, quote, reaping and sowing, unquote, consequences of your own disobedience to God right. and disregard of his word. And I say that in light of 1 Peter 3, 17, for it is better if God should will it so that you suffer for doing right mm-hmm. rather than for doing what is wrong. Without that exception, notwithstanding that, your circumstances are primarily for the purpose of bringing glory to God. Mm-hmm. Hello. Your circumstances are primarily for the purpose of bringing glory to God. Now, to give further biblical perspective on that, I want to quote from the book titled Selections from Spurgeon's Library, in which is included the following from the 18th century Scottish evangelist John Willison. That last name is W-I-L-L-I-S-O-N. John Willison, in chapter one of the aforementioned book, Selections from Spurgeon's Library, chapter one is titled Directions to God's Children Under Affliction. Directions to God's Children Under Affliction, where John Willison writes this, quote, If in this world, then, we must look for tribulation, it is highly necessary for every man to seek direction how to provide for it and behave under it, so as he may glorify God, edify others, and attain to eternal happiness at last. These heavy trials are all needful for you. 
Deep waters are not more needful to carry a ship into the haven than great afflictions are to carry the vessels of our souls into the port of bliss. Strong winds and thunder are frightful, but they are necessary to purge the air. Consider that your affliction, however heavy it may be, will soon have an end. The goldsmith will not let his gold lie longer in the furnace than it needs to be purified. Mm -hmm. The wicked have a sea of wrath to drink. But, oh, drooping believer, take comfort. You have but a cup of affliction, which will soon be exhausted. Oh, believer, God has taken the ordering of your lot in his own hands, and he knows what is fittest for you. God sends great and sore troubles that you may have the more experience of God's wisdom and mercy in your support and deliverance. It is very ordinary for every man in great distress to reckon his case singular. Now, let me pause here and just uh, paraphrase. What Willison is saying here is that it is our default. It's our default mindset and heart attitude to think that what we're going through, that we're the only ones going through. Right, right, right. At that time. Right. Willison said it's very ordinary for every man in great distress to reckon his case singular because he feels best what is nearest to himself, but is a stranger to what his neighbor feels. But Wilson goes on to say, but whatever your case be, you must own your sufferings are not as great as your sins. Hello, man, that's powerful. Mm -hmm. Wilson says, whatever your circumstance, whatever your trial, whatever your affliction, whatever your adversity, you need to remind yourself that your sufferings are not as great as your sins. Wilson closes with this. If our provoked judge, that's, that is God, judge is capital J, if our provoked judge shall, in his clemency, send us into Babylon instead of hell, we have no cause to complain. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> wow. Wilson says, if our provoked judge shall, in his clemency, send us into Babylon instead of hell, we have no cause to complain. Oh, incredible. Anyway, that was John Wilson. From the book Selections from Spurgeon's Library. I want to augment those words from John Wilson with these words from John, John Calvin. Quote, Calvin says this, quote, The believing heart does not haphazardly forge for itself some kind of God. Rather, it looks to him who is the true and only God. It does not ascribe to him whatever qualities it pleases, but is content to take him as he shows himself to be. It is always careful not to depart from God's will through headstrong pride. Knowing him thus and understanding that he governs all things by his providence, it confidently accepts him as guardian and protector and therefore entrusts itself to his keeping since it knows him to be the author of all that is good. If beset by pressing need, it at once falls back on him for help, and after calling on him by name, it awaits his aid. For it is persuaded, it is persuaded that he is both generous and kind. It relies with assurance on his compassion, never doubting that for every distress, there will be a remedy furnished by his mercy. Amen. Unquote. Amen. That was John Calvin. Thoughts on Mahal? couple things, man. I want to go back to the quote that you delivered from John Willison. And, and I'll, start, I'll start with the, the last of it and then go back to the first part of it. The last part of it said, but whatever your case may be, you must own your sufferings are as not as great as your sins, right? You must own yeah. your sufferings wow. are not as great as your sins. We've got to think that whatever we suffer is nothing compared to the magnitude of of our sinfulness mm, uh, amen, to, to, to a sovereign holy wow. God. And the second, the second part of that sentence, he says, if our provoked judge, and you, you rightly stated that's a capital J, meaning the ju judge being the Lord, if our provoked judge shall in his clemency send us into Babylon instead of hell, we have no cause to complain. Bro, first of all, the, thought, the, the, the statement in and of itself is powerful, but if you think about its proper application, what, what that is saying is if we're sent into slavery, Instead of hell. Wait, 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 w
That's what that's what's meant by Babylon, right? We, go, f- go further, bro. Go right, further. Right. <laughs> that's what that's what's meant by Babylon. If we're sent that's, into that's exactly what's meant right there. Absolutely right. So if we're sent into slavery, so 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 for us as as Black Americans sent into slavery, as horrifying as that is, if God in his in his clemency sends us into slavery. Instead of hell, we have no cause to complain. If 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 our if the enslavement of those of our ancestors in Africa who were animus were enslaved and brought to America for the for, for, for the wrong purposes, based upon the wrong means and the evilness of man, that we would come to know Christ, we have no cause to complain. Man, come on. That's I mean wow. that's what that's what's being stated right there. That we could do a oh. whole other show on that, but that but that that those are the kinds of issues that we're dealing with in our culture. And if, if we have our mind rightly set on the things of God, we, we, you know, we, we avoid all of the, all of the worry, all of the turmoil, all of the angst, all of the anger and rage that, that we see uh, in our culture. I said, I said two, I said two quotes. So let me go back. Uh, let me, let me, that, that, that was a rant. Let me get back onto my, <laughs> onto my notes. Uh, Cause it just struck me, man, when you, as you unpack that last part, I just went, Oh my gosh. Uh, the, the, again, the quote from John Willison, where it says, if in this world, then we must look for tribulation, we must look for tribulation. Uh, it is highly necessary for every man to seek direction, how to provide for it and behave under it as he may glor- so as he may glorify God, edify others and attain eternal happiness at last. I mean, th- those are three things, right? To behave under it. In other words, we seek tribulation. We understand that the nature of the of the world in which we live is going to is going to provide for us tribulation, even for the believer, and especially in Scripture would say toward the believer in Christ, toward, toward, toward those who follow Christ, tribulation will follow. We have to understand how we can behave under it, uh, so as to glorify God, to edify others, and attain eternal happiness at last. There's so much. There's so much ground, really. I think in our current culture that we sacrifice. And, and what I mean by that is those of us who are evangelicals have sacrificed ground to the wealth, health, and prosperity gospel. Man, uh, to, on, we, we've, Preach, we've sacrificed ground in that regard to the, to the degree that we have no understanding of the words that you're reading right now. Mm-hmm. We, we, we have no understanding of words that about, about suffering and about seeking tribulation and understanding how we need, are to behave under it because we've, we've seeded that ground. We've, we, mm-hmm. we've, we've, we've bowed the knee to the idea that if we embrace Christianity, then we're going to experience health, wealth, and prosperity. Mm-hmm. That, that's what mm-hmm. we've done. Uh, mm-hmm. I think, think about John 21 where Jesus restores Peter who had betrayed Jesus after and, and, and who it, I'm thinking about again, John 21, where, where Jesus restores Peter. Peter, who's betrayed Jesus by denying him three times. And he asked, Jesus asks Peter three times, Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Peter, if you remember his response, his, Peter's response was, Yes, Lord, I, I love you. You know all things. And in verse 18 of chapter 21, Jesus said the following to Peter He says, This, truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. Verse 19 says this, this was to show the death by which he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, Jesus says to Peter, follow me. Again, I don't remember the last time I heard, of, heard someone expositionally walk through that verse of scripture in in the vast majority of our evangelical churches right the the the, the idea where we, we're not to worry about what's what's going to happen out there but we understand that that god has a direction for us has a plan for us and that is as we follow his plan it may lead us into circumstances that we mm-hmm. don't desire to go right mm-hmm. it may lead us in a direction that we might find uh, a, a heartache heartbreak tribulation, trials, difficult circumstances, but we are to stay focused on following God. Again, I, I say that to, to, to amplify the idea that we don't necessarily have a doctrine of suffering in our current culture. 
how rare it is Come that on. How, how rare it is that we think of the kind of death by which we're to glorify God. It, it's, I, I mean, think about think about the the fact that I, I'm, I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to reconcile in my own mind. When was the last time I thought about the kind of death that I would that that, that God would require of me that would glorify Him most in my life? Better yet, what kind of life would we live if we lived a life in total sacrifice to God? And did so in such a way that our enemies would desire our death. Does that make sense? Man, come on. What, come on, V. What if we focused on a life lived in such a way that our life is completely sacrificed to God and that we lived that life in such a way that our enemies would desire our death? Our current wow. culture greatly esteems the love wow. of the world. Therefore, it's unwilling to do anything that represents the very separation that we are commanded in Scripture to provide. We are not to be of the world. We are to be in the world, but not of it. This reminds me, bro, of a challenge that a friend of mine, Tony Miano, you know Tony, he gave me yep. when I was with him doing street evangelism. Let me tell you this brief story, and I'll let, I'll let us all get back to, to, to this. We, we were out doing street evangelism one time, and I'm passing out pamphlets, handing out uh, gospel tracts, and and we're in this we're in this market and we're passing this stuff out and and I, I remember man uh, while I've done street evangelism in other places this was not an area that I was familiar with and as a result I just didn't feel like myself I was a little nervous a little kind of antsy uh, there were times when I felt bold about handing a, a gospel tract to someone there were times when I kind of felt a little wimpish about doing that you know just kind of the back and forth of that kind of uh, a gospel proclamation. Uh, every time after we would finish up, we would wrap up our time out on the street. Tony would take me you know, to lunch or to dinner or what have you, and, and we would kind of do a briefing of our time together. It was myself and a, a dear brother, uh, Dan Perna, who was with me. Tony asked us, well, how, how'd you guys do? How'd you feel like it went? And, and I had to admit, man, I just said, you know what? I said, I have to admit, man, there's just something in me. I just, I just was kind of nervous, just kind of a little fearful, afraid. And he asked me, he said, well, what do you think that is? And I said, well, it's, it's, it's the fear of man. You know, I'm kind of afraid of, of what, what others kind of think of me and, and, and this, that, and the other, and I'm just kind of uncomfortable. And he, he looked at me and just basically kind of summarized, said, brother, I, you know, I, I know, I know that, that for you, it, the issue is never the fear of man. You're not afraid of man. What, what, what the issue is, is that issue is the love of self. And I said, what, what do you mean? Wow. He said, you love yourself to such a degree that you don't want to be made to look like a fool for the cause and sake of the gospel. And so wow. that's what's really stirring in your heart right now. It's not, the, it's not the, 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 that you have the fear of man. It's that you have the love of self. And when you shed the love of self, you'll be able to easily identify the fact that you have no fear of man. And in that, mm -hmm. going back to what I shared earlier, you will be able to separate yourself from the world. You'll be able to understand what kind of life you're to lead in total sacrifice to God, that your enemies would desire your death. Bro, wow. Wow. That's amazing, man. Thanks for sharing that, V. You know, let me go off script here for one second, because you said something earlier about, uh, you know, God's providence and orchestrating the circumstances and situations of our life. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, obviously to his glory. And, and, and that, that's, that's the, that last segment that we, uh, that we were on, that was the emphasis of that that whatever it is that's causing you uh, to respond sinfully in terms of being fearful and, and anxious, uh, you need to remind yourself of God's providence, God's sovereignty, uh, God's omniscience, his omnipotence, all of the, uh, the attributes that, uh, that God uh, uh, possesses. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was thinking about, uh, I was doing a personal Bible study the other day, and I was in Numbers chapter 33. And I just noted that in, num in Numbers chapter 30, 33, the phrase, they journeyed from, this is in the NESB, mm -hmm. the phrase they journeyed from appears 42 times. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, we have uh, the Exodus account. This is where Moses in chapter 33 of Numbers is recounting. He's reviewing the, uh, their deliverance from Egypt, uh, on their way to the Jordan and to the promised land. But that phrase, they journeyed from, appear, appears 42 times. Mm -hmm. They journeyed from and camped here. They journeyed from there and camped here. Mm -hmm. And 
I'm thinking that sometimes that's how God works in our lives. Now, God could have taken them on a straight A, point A to point B line to the Jordan. Mm -hmm. He could have taken them on a straight line to the Jordan. But what did he do? No. He took them through the wilderness. Mm -hmm. From one place to another, to another and another, 42 times. And sometimes that's how God works. And I like, we want God to take us just straight there. Right. God, I just want to come from point A to point B, if you don't mind. Right. If you please, to make me happy. Right. To make me content, to satisfy me. Because I'm discontent. I'm unhappy. I'm sad. I'm disappointed in my situation. I don't like where I am. Lord, why don't you just take me straight from point A to point B? When we never think, though, oh, yeah, God's going to get you there. He's just going to take you on a more circuitous route. Mm -hmm. But we don't think about that. We, we want God to always just take us from point A to point B. We don't want to have to say, well, God took us from here to there to, to there to there, then to there. We don't want 40-something stops along the way. Right. We want God, if we were honest, we want God to hear our prayer and answer it before we get up off our knees. <laughs> That's what we want. Right. But see, you and I, Omaha, we wouldn't, be, we wouldn't be sitting behind these microphones right now, having put in many hours of preparation beforehand, if we weren't thoroughly convinced of the sufficiency and efficacy of the scriptures mm -hmm. to profitably address the matters we've been discussing here today. Absolutely. But therein lies the rub. When it comes to this matter of sinful fear and anxiety, many professing Christians simply do not believe God's word is sufficient to help them in the areas of their life, such as what we've been discussing today on this episode of the Just Thinking Podcast. Mm -hmm. They don't believe it. Mm -hmm. They just don't. They're seeking counsel and guidance and direction, and yes, even peace from everywhere and from everyone and from everything except God and his word. Mm -hmm. Now, I have no doubt whatsoever that virtually every professing Christian who is within the sound of my voice right now will confess that they believe in God. But I have my doubts that that same number of professing Christians will confess that they believe God. Right. We talked about this earlier. Right. Doubt. Listen, I want to say this. Doubt is the soil in which the roots of sinful fear and anxiety grow deep and bear much fruit. That's good. That's good. Doubt, as I said earlier, the battlefield is the mind. Doubt is the soil in which the roots of sinful fear and anxiety grow deep and bear much fruit. The beloved British pre preacher, uh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, had these penetrating words to say about doubt in a sermon he preached on August 18, 1889, titled, Faith Essential to Pleasing God. Spurgeon said this in that sermon, quote, some of you are always fashioning fresh nets of doubt for your own entanglement. You invent snares for your own feet mm -hmm. and are greedy to lay more and more of them. You are mariners who seek the rocks, soldiers who count the point of the bay who court the point of the bayonet. It is an unprofitable business. Practically, mentally, morally, spiritually, doubting is an evil trade. You are like a blacksmith wearing out his arm and making chains with which to bind himself. Doubt is sterile, a desert without water. Doubt discovers difficulties which it never solves. It creates hesitancy, despondency, and despair. Unquote. Spurgeon says some of you are always fashioning fresh nets of doubt for your own entanglement. Now for for a professing believer in Christ to confess that he or she believes God means they've come to such a point in their sanctification that they realize they're not playing with God using spiritual monopoly money. Okay? When you say, when you can confess that you believe God, you're not playing with mon uh, spiritual monopoly money anymore. You're playing for real. Yeah. Job, under Job understood this. That's good. Job not only believed in God, he believed God. Yes. That's why he was able to say in the midst of everything that was going on around him, even though he didn't have a clue as to why it was happening. Right. Job was still able to say, though he slay me, I will hope in him. That's Job 13, 15. 
See, there is a difference between believing in God and believing God, and that difference can mean everything in the life of the professing believer between living in victory and living in defeat. And when I say victory or defeat, I'm not using those words in some obtuse or op- opaque content, uh, context or in some charismatic sense in which those words have so often been tossed about with no supporting hermeneutical foundation. That's good. I'm using those words in the context of the peace that Jesus, whom the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 2.14, is our peace promises us in John 14, 27, where he says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. That's John 14, 27. You see, we don't often consider that the second half of that verse in John 14, 27 is command. Do not let your heart be troubled. That is a command of our Lord to his people. His people that we can choose that, that is to say that his people can either choose to obey or obey that command, regardless of the situation or circumstances in which we find ourselves. It's as if Jesus is saying to us in that verse that if your heart is troubled, it's because you let it be troubled. <laughs> you've allowed it to be disturbed. And that's because you've taken the eyes of your mind and heart off of me and put them onto the things which you've, you've allowed your flesh with its mature mercurial uh, uh, feelings and emotions to be centered upon. That's Colossians chapter three. Set your mind on things above, not on the things that are on earth. So the command is do not let your heart be troubled. There is no asterisk in that verse so as to point you to some fine print somewhere else in God's word that says to you, yeah, it's okay to allow your heart to be troubled in this situation or that circumstance. Right. You're not going to find an asterisk. There's no fine print there. There is no fine print to be found. Remember, it was Jesus himself in Matthew uh, chapter 11, verses 28 and 29, who said, come unto me, all who are weary and are heavy laden, and I I will give you rest. Mm -hmm. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. That's a promise. That's a promise. Think about those words, Omaha. What is it that the person who is struggling with sinful fear and anxiety wants most for themselves fundamentally. What they want most fundamentally is rest for their soul. Yes, that's good. That's what they want. They, they want that thing that Jesus promises in Matthew 11 that they can have if they just come to him. That's fundamentally what they want. That's exactly what they want. But the rest, the, the, the rest that they so desperately seek is found in Jesus Christ and in him alone. Jesus said in John 16, 33, these things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In this world you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. Mm-hmm. You know, it was the 19th century Scottish churchman Horatius Bernard, who in his commentary on the book of the Revelation uh, and in the chapter uh, titled Fear and Its Remedy said this, quote, the counteraction of all fear, which is the removal of all doubt, comes from the knowledge of Christ himself. So Bernard is saying here that the, conna- the, the counteraction of fear is to remove doubt. Mm. The counteraction of all fear, which is the removal of all doubt, comes from the knowledge of Christ himself. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. He spoke peace to his apostle John by reminding him of who and what he was and is. So does he still speak to us today nor will one fear ever be dispelled or one doubt removed in any other way. Mm -hmm. The sight, listen to this. This is so good. The sight of Christ will do everything. No other sight will do anything. (laughs) Did you hear that? Mm -hmm. This This is Colossians 3. Set your mind on things above. Bernard says the sight of Christ will do everything. No other sight will do anything. A simpler Fuller knowledge of this gracious one is all that we need to give us perfect peace and to keep us in that peace forever. Right. Unquote. Right. That was Horatius Bernard from his uh, commentary on Revelation in the chapter titled Fear and Its Remedy. Bernard said that the sight of Christ will do everything. No other sight will do anything. Now, those sentiments are reflected in the beloved hymn, Be Still My Soul. And Omaha, just like Ecclesiastes 7.14 is probably my favorite verse in the Bible. This this is probably my favorite hymn, Be Still My Soul. Be Still My Soul was written by the 18th century German hymn writer, Katharina von Schlegel, in the year 1752. I just want to read 
uh, a, a couple of uh, uh, words uh, from that hymn. And then I want to associate the, the, the words with, uh, with scriptures. For, uh, for folks who are listening, they can make note of these and go back and study them. Be still my soul, the Lord is on thy side. That's Psalm 4610. Bear patiently the cross of grief or pain. That's James 112. Leave to thy God to order and provide. That's Philippians 419. In every change, he, faithful, will remain. That's 2 Timothy 2.13. Be still, my soul, thy best, thy heavenly friend. That's John 15, verses 14 and 15. Through thorny ways leads to a joyful end. That's Romans 8.28. Be still, my soul, the Lord is on thy side. Through thorny ways, he may take you through some thorny ways. He took the, Egyptian, the Israelites through some thorny ways. 42 different stops on the journey to the promised land. It's not going to always be a straight line, folks. But know that the Lord is on thy side. And through thorny ways, he still leads to a joyful end. Jesus said, in me, you have peace. Not in your hobbies, not in your best friends, not in your parents, not in your job or your bank account or your vacation home or your educational accomplishments or your social media followers or your psychiatrist or your counselor, not even in your husband, your wife, or your church, for that matter. In me, Jesus said, you have peace. Peace is found only in Jesus Christ because only Jesus Christ is peace. The beloved preacher. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, in the sermon he preached on September 25th, 1887, titled, The Child of Light Walking in Darkness, said this. Listen closely, please. Spurgeon said this, quote, It is not what we see that we dread, so much as that which we do not see and therefore exaggerate. Unquote. That's powerful. Spurgeon said, It's not what we see that we dread, so much as that which we do not see and therefore Exaggerate. It's like Flavel said earlier that we make we look at our enemies through a uh, magnifying glass. Mm -hmm. Listen, listen, my dear brother and sister, if you're looking for peace anywhere or in anyone or in anything other than Jesus Christ, you're engaged in a never ending exercise of, of futility because you're not going to find it. As Pastor John MacArthur explains in his book titled Anxious for Nothing, subtitled God's Cure for the Cares of Your Soul, quote, godly peace has nothing to do with human beings or human circumstances. In fact, godly peace cannot be produced on a human level at all. Any peace that can be produced by humans is very fragile. It can be destroyed instantly by failure, doubt, fear, difficulty, guilt, shame, distress, sorrow, the anxiety of making the wrong choice, the anticipation of being mistreated or victimized by someone, the uncertainty of the future, and any challenge to our position or possessions. And we experience these things daily. The peace that God gives us is not subject to the vicissitudes of life. It is a spiritual peace. It is an attitude of heart and mind when we believe and thus know deep down that all is well between ourselves and God. Along with it is the assurance that he is, in, he, he is lovingly in control of everything. We as Christians should know for sure that our sins are forgiven, that God is concerned with our well-being, and that heaven is our destiny, mm. unquote. That was John MacArthur from his book, Anxious for Nothing, God's Cure for the Cares of Your Soul. What you got, Omaha? That was awesome, man. Loved every part of that, especially the quote, the last quote that you gave from Dr. John MacArthur, I mean, as you go back through this, whether it's the hymn that, that you mentioned, um, whether it's the words of Charles Haddon Spurgeon, all of them point to, the, to, to one, to scriptural sufficiency, right? As the, as the hymn writer is, is appealing to scripture in everything that's being written there, and, and then to, uh, to, to Christ and his sovereignty, his, his total... Uh, able enablement as savior he's able to 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 you know as as we stay focused on him uh he's able to keep our mind in perfect peace in fact i go i, I immediately thought of as you were talking that verse of scripture that that often gets me gets memorized but not really anchored in the soul right isaiah mm -hmm. 26 verses 3 and 4 that says you keep him in perfect 
peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trust in mm-hmm. the Lord forever, for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. That's Isaiah 26 verses 3 and 4. All of this points back to the same thing. Again, the last quote that you delivered uh, by John MacArthur uh, was just incredible. It all boils down, and this is something you said early on, It all boils down to whether we believe what Scripture has to say. Amen. At the end of the day, you mentioned it before, you and I, no no matter how how long we take unpacking all of this Scripture and all of these ideas from theologians, uh, both current day and and from back in the day, at the end of the day, what happens is, the, the issue is, what happens to you as a believer when you find yourself in a circumstance or situation when you are consumed with fear and anxiety, when the Bible is absolutely clear about this issue, Scripture tells us to be anxious for nothing. During our time, again, on this episode, I tried to provide practical application as as Daryl really unpacked the richness of the theological weight of this subject. And at the end of the day, it really boils down to who you're going to trust and if you're going to allow Scripture to be sufficient in its you know, effort to calm your soul. Amen, bro. You know, the, uh, the Apostle Peter declares in 2 Peter 1, 3, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. And the word life in 2 Peter 1, 3 is the Greek noun zoe, Z-O-E, mm-hmm. which denotes life that is real and genuine, life that is active and vigorous, life that is devoted to God and blessed by him, not only in the life to come, But in that portion of life, even in this world, of those who place their faith and trust in Christ for the forgiveness of their sins. Now, the very reason you and I are discussing this topic to begin with, Omaha, is because we're convinced of the sufficiency of Scripture to address this issue of fear and anxiety. We know this from Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 and 13, which reads, For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the divisions of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Now that word living, that word living in Hebrews 4.12 is the Greek word zao, that's Z-A-O, which is the verb form of the Greek, Greek noun zoe. The word active in that same verse is the noun energies, E-N-E-R-G-E-S, energies, from which we derive our English word energy. Now, I point this out because when Hebrews 4.12 speaks of God's word being living and active, it means precisely that. The word of God isn't some static, dormant, lifeless, That's passive, good. or latent thing that is comprised of mere words on a page. That's good. It is as the Apostle Paul described it to the believers in the church at Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, where he says this, For this reason we also constantly thank God that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God, which performs its work in you who believe. Now, the reason Paul can say that the word of God performs its work is because the Word of God is literally living and active. Mm -hmm. The Word of God is supernaturally imbued by the Spirit of God from whom the Word of God emanates and is made effectuous, efficacious rather, so as to perform its work in the hearts and minds of those who believe Mm -hmm. His work. Mm -hmm. And we, we, we see this divine vivification all the way back in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, which reads, The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Now, that, that the Scripture describes the spirit, the spirit of God as moving or hovering, as some translations render it, over the surface of the water is to emphasize that the Spirit of God is animate, not inanimate. The Spirit of God is living and active, not dormant or passive. So, yes, the Word of God is completely sufficient, as John Owen, whom I quoted at the outset of this episode, said to help us recover from our weaknesses. And as I said earlier, as fallen and sinful human beings, we all have weaknesses. 
But thanks be to God that as, as the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 4.15, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. All this to say, Omaha, that for the Christian, for the professing believer in Jesus Christ, the first step to overcoming sinful fear and anxiety is to believe God and to trust what he has said to us in his word. Mm -hmm. Now, with that in mind, I'd like our listeners to focus on this wise and godly counsel from the book by Dr. David Paulus entitled Seeing with New Eyes, subtitled Counseling and the Human Condition Through the Lens of Scripture, where Dr. Paulus says this, quote, Human beings instinctively oscillate between two sinful extremes. In the objective mode, we typically deny feelings and, and so avoid the realities of interior life. Much of the time, people are pragmatic, unreflective, driven by external pressures or by unstated demands, fears, and goals. In the subjective mode, on the other hand, we typically indulge feelings and so make feelings supreme. Mm. Getting in touch with denied feelings is the world's way of addressing one problem by creating another. That's good. The Holy Spirit and the Word of God set us free to live in a third way. This third way neither denies personal honesty or equates truth with such honesty. You must pay attention to feelings. You must not live as if feelings are the supreme reality. Did you hear that, listener? Dr. Paulson is saying, yes, pay attention to your feelings, but don't live as if your feelings are the supreme reality. Dr. Paulson continues, the feeling of being overwhelmed often drives people to God, to self-evaluation, to, self -evaluation, to seeking help. It also often sets people up for reacting via workaholism, mm -hmm. suicide, anger. You were saying this exact same thing earlier, Omaha. Dr. Paulson said it also often sets people up for reacting via workaholism, suicide, anger, depression, drugs, or other such escapisms. Is this feeling normative? Mm -hmm. No. It has a cause you need to discover and a way of escape you need to find. Because God is faithful. Amen. Unquote. Amen. That was Dr. David Paulison from his book titled Seeing with New Eyes, subtitled Counseling and the Human Condition Through the Lens of Scripture. Thoughts on Mahal? Yeah. I, I, man, there's so much that you laid out in that. I, I want to start out by saying that our, our culture worships at the altar of emotion. Man, whoa, whoa, whoa. I need some Hammond B3 right here, bro. Bring in the mascot. I need you to cue up the mascot, bro, because that was, bro, that was heavy. Say that again, V. Our culture currently worships at the altar of emotion. And, and as a result, feelings and what we feel reigns supreme. Sovereignty is given to feelings and emotion. And uh, Pastor Josh Bice always has a tendency to say repeatedly, and he reminds us of this, that culture has a tendency to deform our worship, and, and our attendance at church reforms our mind uh, so that we can truly think in the manner in which God desires us to think, uh, so that we can operate in the manner that God desires for his people to think. And what, what was happening for me as you walked back through this section, every scripture that you read was a, a reforming in the mind so that mm -hmm. we're not beholden to, to, the, to the emotion of our day as, as, again, culture worships at that altar. So when you read 1 Thessalonians 2.13, where it says, for this reason, we, are const we constantly thank God that when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God, which performs its work in you who believe. It performs its work. The, 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 the word of God is not static. You use the word divine vivification. And, and I, I immediately thought, I wonder how, ma how many people actually understand that the, the, the word vivification. If you go and look up to vivify, it actually means to give life to give mm -hmm. vigor to to animate mm -hmm. 
uh, to 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 provide an, an, an intensity toward invigoration. It, it's it's the, it it summarizes that word. It's an older English word that that gets used. You use the word divine vivification. So think of it from a standpoint of God empowering life giving. Right. That's what the word of Amen. God yep. is intended to provide for us. And then you mentioned Hebrews four fifteen. We do not have a high priest. This is so sobering if we really focus our mind and attention on this. Uh, Hebrews 4.15, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. We have a, a, a God who understands where we've been because of what has happened through the through the finished work of Christ. He's lived a, a, the, the life coming in the form of a, of, of a of an embryo, right? Of a human being who walked the earth and yet was without sin. So he he, he he's at the right hand of the Father, interceding on our behalf and understanding our condition, yet he was without sin. We can have the confidence and comfort of knowing that we serve a God who is indeed transcendent, but is also eminent God with us. And so there was, there was just so much there that, that I thought really anchors us. It really should, we, we should be at the point at which our listeners are understanding the, what scripture is to provide for us, the, 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 the peacefulness that we're to experience as a result of our true embrace of what scripture provides for us. I love what you said there, bro, especially when you made the comment that our God is not only transcendent, but he's also imminent. Yeah. That's powerful. Yeah. That's powerful, man. You know, Omaha, as we prepare to close out this episode of the Just Thinking Podcast, there is much more that we could have said, much more ground that we could have covered here. Uh, but I pray that what we have shared has been somewhat edifying to someone who, by God's providence, has been listening to this episode today. As we said at the top of the episode, this is an extremely weighty and broad topic, and we've done our best to give our listeners at least a high-level perspective of what Scripture says about dealing biblically with sinful fear and anxiety. But I want to say this as we prepare to close out. The cure for sinful fear and anxiety is a heart-centered trust in God and in His infallible and inerrant Word. We, we, we've been talking, we've been hammering, if there's one thing we've been hammering home in this episode is believe, 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 believe. You must believe. You must believe. This is true regardless of whether the fear and anxiety you're dealing with right now has to do with something that occurred today or in this recent or distant past. Speaking of the past, I want to quote from uh, my ACBC counseling supervisor, Dr. Steve Viers, and his book's his great book titled Putting Your Past in Its Place, subtitled Moving Forward in Freedom and Forgiveness. Because I think, I think there are I mean, countless probably listeners who are uh, hearing me right now and they are they are they are enslaved they are shackled to their past mm -hmm. uh something that happened in their past maybe a, maybe something that didn't happen in their past but maybe they're living in regret over a decision they made in the past or they didn't make in the past please listen closely here to what dr steve virus has to say in his book titled putting your past in its place subtitled moving forward in freedom and forgiveness. Dr. Vire says this quote, what was God thinking? He could have made us without the capacity to remember. Every day would literally be a new day with no memories, no past, and no baggage. Would that make, it, would that make life better? If you could walk through a device similar to a metal detector at an airport, but one that would erase your past and its effect on you today, would you do it? And would you be better off? Some people seem to think so. Mm -hmm. They describe the past with phrases such as toxic past, wounded inner child, or damaged emotions. In many cases, they do so with good reason. But does that mean that the past in its entirety is a bad thing? Would we all be better off if we could completely erase our memories and the impact our past has on our lives today? Not if we allow God's word to guide us. Mm. The Bible gives us several ways our past can be among our best friends. Of course, your past is not an it. It is not a separate entity, but it is a record in part of the way God has related to you and worked in your life. The goal, listen how Dr. Virus closes this out. The goal is not to focus on it but to focus on who God is and what he has done. 
Amen. Unquote. Mm -hmm. Dr. Steve Viers, again, from his book, <clears throat> excuse me, putting your past in its place, moving forward in freedom and forgiveness. You know, Omaha, Mark chapter 11, verse 22. Jesus encouraged Peter and the other disciples to, quote, have faith in God, unquote. Jesus wasn't talking about a blind faith in God, but the kind of faith of which the apostle John speaks of in 1 John 4, 4, where he says, you are from God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And conversely, in 1 John 5, chapter 5, verses 4 and 5, which read, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is the one who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Now, the word victory in 1 John 5, 4, 4b is the Greek noun Nike. Yeah, that's spelled, that's it's that word, N-I-K-E. That's the Greek word for the word victory, which is used in the context of successfully overcoming an obstacle or some adversity. Each of us has experienced fear and anxiety at various times in our lives. Each of us has been sinfully afraid and fearful at one point or another. To deny that would be to deny our very humanity. And yet it is on that note that I want to say this, Omaha. You and I are sitting here under the pretense. We're not sitting here under the pretense of being experts on how to deal with sinful fear and anxiety. Right. We're simply two redeemed sinners who by the grace of God and as God providentially imparts his divine wisdom to us through his Holy Spirit are simply trying to point other redeemed sinners and even unredeemed sinners to the one in whom they can trust and depend on in those moments when they're feeling overwhelmed by thoughts and feelings of fear and anxiety. Yeah. It says the psalmist writes in Psalm 94 verse 17 through 19, if the Lord had not been my help, my soul would soon have dwelt in the abode of silence. If I should say, my foot has slipped, your loving kindness, O Lord, will hold me up. When my anxious thoughts multiply within me, your consolations delight my soul. And in 1 Peter 5, verses 6 and 7, Therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. And speaking of God's care for his people, listen to these encouraging and reassuring words by John Flavel from his excellent book titled Keeping the Heart. Again, the Puritan John Flavel from his book Keeping the Heart. Quote, learn to quench all slavish creature fears in the reverential fear of God. This is a cure by diversion. It is an exercise of Christian wisdom to turn those passions of the soul which most predominate into spiritual channels, to turn natural anger into spiritual zeal, natural mirth into holy cheerfulness, and natural fear into a holy dread and awe of God. This method of cure Christ prescribes in the 10th chapter of Matthew, similar to which is Isaiah chapter 8 verses 12 and 13. Fear not their fear, but how shall we help it? Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself and let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. Natural fear may be allayed for the present by natural reason, or the removal of the occasion. But then it is like a candle, blown out by a puff of breath, which is easily blown in again. But if the fear of God extinguish it, then it is like a candle quenched in water, which cannot easily be rekindled. Pour out to God in prayer those fears which the devil and your own unbelief pour in upon you in times of danger. Prayer is the best outlet to fear. Where is the Christian that cannot set his seal to this direction? I will give you the greatest example to encourage you to compliance, even the example of Jesus Christ. When the hour of his danger and death drew nigh, he went into the garden, separated from his disciples, and there wrestled mightily with God in prayer, even unto agony in reference to which the apostle says, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong cries and tears to him that was able to save from death and was heard in that he feared. He was heard as to strength and support to carry him through it, though not as to deliverance or exemption from it. Let me pause here and just say, 
This is what I was alluding to back when I went to, uh, to Daniel 3. Uh, what Flavel is saying here is that Christ, that God the Father heard the prayer of Christ his Son, though not as to deliverance from that situation, though. Not as to deliverance but, or exemption from it. We need to understand that. This is exactly what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were saying to King Nebuchadnezzar. Our, fa- our God will deliver us from this furnace, but he, even if he doesn't, you see, this is what Flavel is saying here as well. Flavel continues with this. Oh, that these things may, ab- may abide with you and be reduced to practice in these evil days and that many trembling may be established by them, unquote. So when, when Flavel says uh, uh, by these words that many trembling may be established, what he's saying is that you may, you may have a sense of peace. You may have a sense of calm, that you're not going to be rattled. Uh, and, and in closing, Omaha, I want to thank our listeners. We're going to wrap up here. I want to thank our listeners for hanging in there with us on this episode of the Just Thinking Podcast. I realize this was a very challenging topic to address, and we thank you all for taking the time to go through this episode with us. And I want to leave our Just Thinking Podcast listeners with this admonition from the Apostle Paul in Colossians 3, verses 15 and 16 as application. Colossians 3, 15 and 16. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Let the, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. And when you consistently obey those two commands, you'll have no legitimate reason to be fearful or anxious about anything. Okay, anything. Lastly, I exhort you to consider prayerfully these encouraging words from the book, Depression, Anxiety, and the Christian Life, subtitled, Practical Wisdom from Richard Baxter by Dr. Michael S. Lundy. Dr. Michael S. Lundy's book, Depression, Anxiety, and the Christian Life, Practical Wisdom from Richard Baxter, where the Puritan Richard Baxter says this, quote, Do not overlook the miracle of love that God has shown us in the wonderful incarnation, office, life, death, resurrection, ascension, and reign of our Redeemer. Rather, steep your thoughts most of all in these wonders of mercy ordained by God to be the primary substance of your thoughts. You should rationally bring to mind any thoughts about Christ and grace for each one you list about your sin and misery, but in a manner that tends to magnify the remedy and to cause you to embrace it, unquote. And I want to leave our listeners Omaha with this benediction, and I'll, close you, I'll turn it over to you to close this out and pray for us. I'll leave our listeners with this benediction from Romans chapter 15, verse 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Mm. Man, just Omaha, some, that's all I got, bro. Yeah, okay. just some great thoughts all the way around. And again, as those who listen to us uh, on the Just Thinking podcast know, we, we take our time. We walk through it. If it's a two-hour episode, it is. If it's a three-hour episode, it is. So again, to the point that Daryl made earlier, we want to thank you all for for hanging with us. We hope that what you find in what we've delivered here is a a treasure trove of resources uh, that you can really go to and grab some some more in-depth thoughts and ideas from. This is a this is a virtual library, if you will, of of resource material uh, for you to kind of engage at a deeper level for those who do fear. Much like the episode on assurance, our hope and prayer is that this is this episode in particular on, on fear uh, and anxiety will be one that, that you'll recommend to others and that you'll listen to over and over and over again. Let me pray for us and we'll close. Father God, we just give you thanks and praise for who you are, for what you've done, uh, for the sacrifice of your son and in securing uh, our redemption. Uh, we can draw nigh unto you. We can we can rely upon you. We can keep our mind focused on you and understand that as we do, we will be at perfect peace. We pray for those who are listening that this uh, platform that we've uh, utilized to deliver the truth of your word can be used uh, to benefit your church, to benefit the, the the listener, that they may be edified and that they may be pointed directly uh, into the loving arms of their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For those who are listening who may not know you, I pray that you use this as a tool to stir their heart, to draw them unto yourself, 
that they may come to a saving knowledge of the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Christ for the forgiveness of sin. We ask this all in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for that, V. Well, thank you once again for joining us on this episode of the Just Thinking Podcast. We look forward to you checking in with us next time. Take care and God bless. 